but I like you. You know that. Right at that moment, a girl walked over to them. Babe! Immediately, Nam turned around and pulled her in his arms. Here you are. Then he kissed her on the lips, and Ronnie was frozen in her spot. Who, who is she? Ah, uh, I forgot. She's Chi, my girlfriend. Hello. Wh what You're lying! If you have a girlfriend, I must have known! Just want to keep my personal life and work life separate. Cryptic much? Then Nam and his newly announced girlfriend walked off, leaving Veronica behind with a broken heart. But I've liked you first! So my love since I was 14 had withered even before it started to bloom? Turns out I was just fooling myself all this time. That night, Veronica couldn't sleep a wink. It was too painful for her to face the truth, but she couldn't help showing up in Nam's hotel the next day. But little did she expect that since that day, she was everywhere in the hotel and literally clinging to Nam. Oh, Bay, sit down here. You've been wandering in my dreams enough. Your legs might get hurt. So you come sit here too. I'm afraid I have a serious vitamin D deficiency because I was far away from you. My only sunshine for the whole night. And that only made Veronica filling in frustration. And also suspicion. Say ah. Uh, I woke up early to cook for you. My bae needs the most organic and fresh food ever in this world. But he's allergic to peanuts. Oops, is it so? You, cheese, right? It's chi, no ending sound. <laughs> Whatever, what kind of girlfriend are you not knowing your boyfriend's allergy? How reckless. His face would be seriously swollen like a chipmunk eating that. There must be something off between them. Hey, how did you guys meet? We met in Delat. Right, on a business trip. Thursday, September 21st, last year. It doesn't need to be that detailed, does it? The next day, Nam's hotel was throwing a small party within the staff. It was fun, but seeing the lovey-dovey couple was only a bug in the eye to Veronica. So she left for some fresh air. And when returning to the main hall, Veronica overheard Chi talking on the phone with somebody. I got what you want, Bay. You're right. This guy Nam has nothing besides being rich. W what So she just used Nam for money? What a snake! Veronica was about to jump to confront her, but she'd gone away, so she immediately came to find Nam and was excited to expose his so-called girlfriend's real face. But instead, he went blast on her. You stop your nonsense already! She's a good-natured girl, not some spoiled young lady who insists on having anything she wants. Are you implying I am that spoiled young lady? Your words, not mine. You've gone too far, Nam. I like you, but it doesn't mean you can talk rubbish about me. Okay, fine. I'd leave you alone. And with that, Veronica ran away, tears streaming down her cheeks. This is what he's been thinking of me? I've known him for ages, but now he treated me like a thorn in his eye. And even thought ill of me just because of some random girl? Right then, Chi approached Nam. Is there something wrong? Nothing. Anyway, thank you for your cooperation. Seems like she's not gonna be messing anymore. You're welcome. Ah, uh, and also deliver my thanks to him. His idea is top notch. Then Nam left, but he wasn't sure he's happy with what just happened. Was I too harsh on her? Early the next morning, Veronica was woken by a knock. What are you doing here? I remember not making any troubles to you since last night. Um, today I will have a trip to Hoi An to build a customized tour for our hotel's customers. Wanna join? No, I don't want to bother you. If so, what a pity. <sighs> I just happen to know a good bang me, Hoi An. But you don't want to go. It's okay. Huh? Why didn't you say it sooner? I've always wanted a bite on Hoi An Bang Mai. Sign me in! <laughs> By the way, it's Bang Me, not Bang Mai. Okay, Bang Me. Yeah, that's it. Later, when they arrived in Hoi An, Ronnie was mesmerized by the medieval grace of this ancient town. The streets of gold and yellow houses were blooming in colorful paper flowers along with vibrant lanterns. Wandering around the town, Ronnie felt a surge of excitement and nostalgia about her country of birth that she parted since she was small. Aw, this is cute. And here! <laughs> Ronnie, now we look like twins. Let's take a picture together. Twin my butt? Oh, I almost forgot the real reason I'm going here. But they came to the Bang Me store to see it was jammed with people queuing. That didn't make Ronnie waver a bit, as the mouth-watering Bang Me was the only thing in her mind now. She had been patiently waiting for her turn for almost 30 minutes. But right then there was a girl with little puppy eyes looking up to her. Ronnie looked at her, then her newly baked Bang Me on her hands. And after a few seconds of hesitation, she gave it to the little girl. Hey kid, it's now yours! Huh? What's she doing? Hasn't she been longing for it all this time? Got bored already? Poof, 
I just don't want those kids to wait under this scorching heat. Okay, okay. Go eat under that tree. I'll get you another one. You want some? Nah, I've eaten enough. <laughs> Nam's buying bread for me. So sweet. His kind offer made her heart dance like crazy. Not knowing from afar, she was glaring at her with bullet eyes. Ronnie was happily devouring her bread when she noticed an old woman with the bamboo yoke selling something strange. What's this? Bang yak do. Buy it. Yummy, yummy. It's Vietnamese dragon beard candy. Candy? So those threads are edible? Buy it for me, Nam. Bay, only kids like this. But Nam still agreed to get some for Ronnie. She was excited about the strange snacks, maybe too excited that she blew the powder so hard, accidentally getting it all over Chi's face. What? How dare you? Uh, oops, I'm so sorry, but you look like Snow White. Just a bit of a variation. <laughs> Are you okay? Oh, I'm okay. Super okay. No big deal, sis. Do I look okay to you? I think she's not some kind of sweet girl she seems to be. Just wait and see. I'm gonna expose you. And you know what? If Nom wasn't here, today would be your end. Later that night, Chi secretly went outside to meet someone. How shameless she is! The audacity of her acting flirty with someone having a girlfriend? I'm afraid she would mess up our plan, hun. If so, we'd better hurry up. I know what to do. The next morning, seeing no one around, Chi snuck into Nam's office and rummaged everywhere. Gosh, this clean freak! Where would he keep the documents? Then a mysterious drawer in the shelf caught her eyes. She was about to crack it when Nam's assistant walked in. Hey, what are you doing here? It's not a place you can easily walk in like this. Then do you know who I am to speak disrespectfully like this? I'm your boss's girlfriend, so I can go to his office whenever I want. You guys, stop! Miss Mai, you can retreat now. When the assistant left, Nam looked around his office, now turned upside down for some reason. Chi, can you tell me what you're doing in my office? Uh, nothing. I just... I'm just looking for my purse here. And you, you've just embarrassed me in front of your employee while you're supposed to protect me. Then a big falling out broke between them. And right at the time, Veronica was passing by and heard their lousy arguments. Ooh, what's this? <laughs> I said it right. Everyone knows they're not for each other just by looking. See, they're already beefing each other fiercely even before I lay a finger. <laughs> Then I had to remind you that you're just my fake girlfriend. Please know the boundary here. Fine, your fake girlfriend will go. Let me see how you deal with your tail. Isn't the purpose of hiring me to chase off Miss Annoying Veronica? You... Mind your words. You need me more than you think, sweetie. Veronica was shattered into pieces with the information she just got. So, nothing's going on between them for real. But Nob hates me this much? To even hire a nobody to be his girlfriend? Just to get away from me? What did I do wrong? That night, Ronnie was crying to sleep with an aching heart. Days after, she locked herself in a room and buried in blankets with the haunting thoughts she couldn't brush off. Nam texted to ask about Ronnie, but now she didn't want anything to do with him. It was not until Grayson knocked the door that Veronica sluggishly got up. Ronnie, are you okay? I'm fine. Just leave me alone. What do you mean, fine? Look, your eyes are swollen like golf balls. Nam asked me about you. Hey, are you two fighting? Just go! Ask about me? Drop it. I'd better not trouble Nam no more. Guess I'll go back to the States now. As saying, she immediately packed all her stuff and booked the flight at night back to home. On the way, she saw a familiar figure. Chi? What is she doing here at our house at this time? Bay, I'm here, and I brought you the thing you asked me to find in Nam's office. It surely could help our plan. Sensing something off, Ronnie followed her to a dark alley, where Chi set up a meeting with her mysterious partner. See what you got, my sweet pie? Veronica couldn't believe her eyes. Her brother and her crush's fake girlfriend were hooking up? What the heck happened here? You and her? Grayson and Chi looked stunned. Why are you here? It is as important as what I'm seeing right now. Better have a good explanation for this. They exchanged their looks, and Grayson finally gave in, telling everything to his sister. Okay, Ronnie, listen carefully. It's me who suggested Nam to have Chi as his fake girlfriend. Actually... W what But you two? Yes, she's my baby girl and he has no idea. But what for? For his master plan, sis? It's time you know the truth. You still remember why we're in Vietnam, right? Our resort is having a hard time, and it's all because of Nam. This resort once belonged to his family, but their poor business skills only plunged this lucrative business into chaos. And when our family revived the resort, he got jealous and did everything to put it down again. This little ungrateful brat. No, 
Nam isn't that person. Don't defend him. Don't you see when our family had a scandal? His hotel was suddenly doing better than normal? No way I let that slide easily. It proves nothing. You cannot accuse someone without any evidence. Fine, you want evidence? I'll find it for you. Meanwhile, if you can't be helpful, then don't sabotage my plan. Deal! I'll leave you one week, and during that time, you're not gonna do anything dirty against Nam as well. The siblings set themselves in a different side on this manner. Grayson was leaving with his girlfriend, while Ronnie was standing here, trying to process everything. It had been such a hard time full of news and truths to her. Yes, the Nam I know would never do such a thing, and I will stay here to prove that my brother has been wrong about him. I hope so. Bae, don't you really let this slide just because your sister said some stupid words, do you? No way, Bae. You know how stubborn my sis is. I only agree so that she could leave us alone. The plan sticks, Bae. The next morning, Veronica went back to work at Nam's hotel as if nothing happened. Oh, you're here? I thought I forced you too much that you dropped already. No, I'm fine. Who do you think I am? Considering me a bug, and now he even thought I'm a quick quitter? Full combo, huh? <sighs> Right then, Chi suddenly appeared, then threw her arms around Nam's neck and kissed him on his cheeks. Hi, Bay. What can I help you with today? Oh, hi, Ronnie. Long time no see. Seeing Chi acting shamelessly loving around Nam in front of Ronnie when she knew all the truth even irked her more. Can't underestimate this snake. What is she scheming? I'd better watch out on her. Later that day, while working near the kitchen, Veronica spotted Chi doing something fishy. Who put those books on the upper shelf? And why were my clothes in the closet reorganized? Did she seriously go into my room and rearrange my stuff? Unbelievable! Avery, dinner's ready. Okay, Dad, wait a sec. My dad shouted back. What's taking you so long? Come down now. Dinner is getting cold. Ugh, okay, I'm coming. As I walked into the kitchen, I gave her a resentful look. What were you doing? You know dinner's always at six. Well, that's because she went into my room and reorganized everything. It was like Hurricane Katrina stopped by my room. I had to put everything back where it was. You must be wondering why I had this attitude towards my mom. Well, first, she isn't my mom. She's my stepmom. And second, I just couldn't stand her. You see, my parents divorced when I was 15, and after just six months, my dad started dating Rose. My first impressions weren't great. I mean, look at her. Okay, she's kind of beautiful, but her style just doesn't fit her age. She has this whole wannabe rocker thing going on. No, I'm serious. She even has a tank top that says, I'm a rocker mom. My actual mom was the total opposite of Rose. She looks how a mom's meant to, with her elegant clothes and polite demeanor, and that's also how she raised me to be. Then there's the age difference. Rose is a decade younger than Dad. Suspicious? What if she was only after his money? I thought they wouldn't last, but then one year later, they announced that they were getting married. So, yeah, you can see where my hate was coming from. That's enough of me telling you about my family. Let's go back to this boring dinner. My dad just gently said, Rose was just helping you. She didn't mean it. Now let's dig in. This smells delicious, honey. Ugh, whatever. I rolled my eyes and sat at the table. I looked down and couldn't believe my eyes. It was spinach and sausage lasagna, Mom's signature dish. How dare Rose copy it? First, she rearranged my room, and now she wanted to replace my mom? Talk about a real-life evil stepmom. No way I was going to eat that. So I stood up, said I wasn't hungry, and started walking off. Dad stood up and was about to yell at me, but Rose stopped him. Whatever. I still ran upstairs and slammed my door shut. The next day, when I came home from school, I saw that Rose had a few friends over for beer and pizza in the living room. Look at them. They looked like they were having a band meeting. Normally, women their age have tea parties, not fast food fests. Hey, Avery. Rose greeted me. I just ignored her and went upstairs. But suddenly, I heard one of her friends say, What a stubborn kid. Doesn't she have manners? 
If I were you, I would show the kid who's the boss around here. Jesus, her friends were awful just like her. Whatever, I didn't care what they said. But then Rose replied, Hey, don't talk about her like that. Avery's a lovely girl. She's just had a lot going on the past two years. Every child would behave the same after their parents' divorce, don't they? She just needs a little time adjusting. Oh, wow. I didn't expect those words coming from Rose. She actually stood up for me? Maybe, just maybe, I've misjudged her. Maybe I should try and give her a fairer chance? So that evening, when I saw her watching a movie, I walked over with a big bowl of popcorn and asked if I could join her. Rose looked shocked, like she'd seen a ghost or something. Then she gave me a big smile and said, Of course, I would really love that. I sat down next to her, and we watched Mad Max together. Oh, wow. There was a lot of violence and some weird-looking characters. Normally, I don't watch these kinds of films. I'm more of a rom-coms girl. But that movie was really, um, interesting. We talked during it, and I must say Rose is actually kinda cool. We were both laughing when I heard someone coughing behind me. I turned around to see my mom standing there with a frown on her face. Avery? Why didn't you return my calls and messages? Oh, I haven't introduced my mom to you yet. This is my beautiful mom, Melanie. She's a kind, gentle, elegant woman, and also a bit disciplined. But that's okay. I still love my mom very much. Mom? What are you doing here? I called you a dozen times, but you didn't answer. Clearly, you're preoccupied. I got worried, so I swung by to check on you. Oh, sorry, Mom. Rose and I were having so much fun that I didn't notice my phone. My mom knitted her brows and asked, Are we still on for shopping tomorrow? You need a new outfit for the debate contest, right? Yeah, of course. I will meet you at the mall after school. Oh, you two are going shopping? That's so cool. Can I join? At that moment, I thought, what a great idea. I mean, so far, they seem to get along okay. But what I didn't know was that a war between my mom and my stepmom had just launched. Rose gave me an excited smile. But mom, on the other hand, didn't look so thrilled. Maybe she was still mad that I missed her calls? So the next day after school, I went outside and saw my mom standing by her car. Oh, was she waiting for me? I was about to walk toward her when I suddenly noticed she was giving dirty looks to someone. Oh my god, Rose was waiting on the other side of the street. I quickly jumped behind some bushes to hide from them. Don't tell me the two were here to pick me up. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was mom. There's no way I was deciding between them. So I told her I was already on my way to the mall. Ugh. Now, let's talk about my fun family day out at the mall. Hmm. It was a disaster. My mom and Rose have very different style, hobs. So my mom chose this elegant black vest and skirt for me, but Rose thought I looked like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> no offense, she's a badass who brought justice to women. But Rose was kind of right. That outfit just didn't work for me. Then Rose chose this red dress for me. But, oh man, that's kind of revealing. They were constantly dragging me from this shop to the other like they were playing tug of war. And I was the freaking rope. I couldn't handle it anymore. Therefore, I just chose any dress so they'd stop throwing clothes in my face. On the way out of the mall, we passed a piercing shop. I've been wanting a helix piercing at the upper cartilage of my ear. They look so cool. I asked mom, but she profusely refused. Her own words were, it would make you look rebellious. His mom was still strict as always. Nonsense. Rose snorted. Melanie, Avery's old enough to make her own decisions. If she wants a piercing, then let her. Then she turned to me and said, come, I will take you inside. Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. I glanced at mom and she looked like she was about to explode with anger. But Rose had a point. I'm already 16 for crying out loud. After 15 minutes, Rose and I came out. Oh, thank God. Did you reconsider getting that ear piercing? 
Oh, yeah. Rose said that a nose piercing would suit me better. What? Uh-oh. Maybe the nose piercing wasn't such a good idea, because the tension between them was now catastrophic. Hmm. I needed a way to bring them together. So I came up with a brilliant plan. I arranged a holiday in Brazil for us all. I have a friend there, Pedro. He was an exchange student at my school, so he could show us around. Dad was in on the plan. At the last minute, he pretended to be busy and canceled his spot. Perfect. Now Rose and Mom would have plenty of bonding time. As soon as we walked into the hotel lobby, they started fighting over who got to share a room with me. What's wrong with them? We just landed in Brazil. So I took the keys from the receptionist and told them they were sharing, because I'll be by myself. <laughs> then in the evening, after we all got some rest, I waited for them in the lobby. Man, what's taking them so long? Suddenly, I saw two women walking over, and they were pushing each other. My God, it was Rose and Mom. I tried to keep calm and said, Jesus, can you two please stop acting like kindergarten kids? Mom sneered. Well, Rose over here took a 45-minute shower while I urgently needed to use the bathroom. You know how sensitive my stomach is. Rose rolled her eyes. That's because I have a strict beauty routine to follow. At least you got some sleep. I didn't, thanks to your bulldozer snoring. I certainly did not. Then they began to stare off like two UFC fighters. I shouted, Enough already! Listen up! I just made a dinner reservation for you two to get to know each other better. I have plans with Pedro, so I'll catch you both later. They were about to refuse, but I gave them this really intense look. Well, at least you're having fun. You two should hit a bar. Nothing can top some Brazilian bars. No drinking! And be back by 10 p.m. tops. Yeah, yeah, I know. Have fun! I waved at them and left the hotel. The next morning, I saw them talking to each other. Actually talking, not bickering. So I walked over to them and asked, Well, how was dinner? Then they told me it was actually really great. They were able to put their differences aside and got along. Success! <laughs> so now I could enjoy the rest of the trip. After breakfast, Pedro came by to take us on a hiking trip in the forest. It was so wonderful. The fresh air, the birds singing. Well, maybe except for the heat and the mosquitoes. Pedro wanted to bring us to this spot he said was perfect for watching the sunset. Awesome! It was all going well at first, but then as Rose avoided a tree branch, it accidentally hit my mom. My God, you hit me on purpose, didn't you? What? That's absurd. I was just avoiding the branch. Oh, please. As if. Are you saying that I'm lying? Hey, guys, stop it. Let's be more understanding and talk things out. Like how you did it last night, okay? That's when I found out that they were just pretending to be friends so that I didn't set up any more dinners for them. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. After their friendship act was exposed... They began speed hiking, like they were in a competition or something. But, yep, after only 15 minutes, they were exhausted and couldn't even stand straight anymore. I began to shout at them. This is great. Your dumb feud is ruining my vacation. Then I walked away to avoid them, but of course, not too far. As I walked, I tried to think of another plan to get them close. Then I realized I'd wandered further away from the group. Okay, Avery, don't panic. Pedro had given me a map of the forest. I just needed to get to that marked X. It sounded easy. Trust me, it wasn't. I walked for hours and still couldn't find the spot. Oh no, it was getting dark and I was totally exhausted. I sat on the ground and couldn't hold back my tears. I was about to lose hope when I suddenly heard Rose and Mom's voices. Oh, great. I was lost and could still hear them arguing in my head. I must be losing my mind. But wait. Suddenly, they appeared from behind some trees. It was really them. I couldn't believe it. 
I ran into their arms and gave them both the biggest hug ever and cried like a baby. Before we went to the airport to head home, Pedro came to say goodbye. Thanks for the hiking trip and also carrying out my plan. No problem. Your plan was definitely crazy, but it totally worked. After you went missing, they actually teamed up to find you. They helped one another when one tripped down or got exhausted and kept each other motivated. Pedro grinned at me, then continued. I too was freaking out when I didn't see you at our meeting point. Luckily, I still found you. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that pretending to be lost was a part of my plan, but what I didn't expect was to actually get lost. Thank God for Pedro. And you know what? After that incident, my mom and Rose grew close. Actually, a bit too close, I think. <laughs> they even sometimes hang out without me. Can you believe it? Turns out, even though they have two very different personalities and styles, they still have one big thing in common. They both love me. Hey, I'm Sage, but you can call me Witch. That's what all the townspeople call me anyway. My folks run a funeral home called Black Rose, and some superstitious people consider this a bad omen. By some, I mean the entire town. Everything about us is spooky and weird. Wanna see our house? It kinda has that monster house vibe, and looks like a fort in the middle of this dollhouse neighborhood. I did try making friends with the other kids, but it never worked out. Ah, don't eat the cookies, they're poisoned. Despite all that, Mom and Dad found their work meaningful and put a lot of effort into it. Well, maybe a little too much? I guess the reason why they're so emotional is because they know what it feels like to lose someone dear to them. My little sister Leah's missing, and it's all my fault. We'd searched for her everywhere for five years, but still, no news. It was a terrible time for my family, but instead of showing us support, the neighbors spread absurd rumors about Leah's disappearance. Some said the devil took her, while others said we sacrificed her during a satanic ritual. These heartless people were never going to change their minds about us, so I decided to just go along with it. This is why no one dares to bother me, as they don't want to be cursed- Ouch! Oh, sorry miss, we're just trying to catch that bird! Please don't curse us! Jesus, that poor little thing! If you hurt an innocent creature again, I'll turn you into one and see how you like having stones shot at you. Blood drained immediately from their faces as they screamed and bolted. I carefully took the bird out of the bush, then brought it to my forest house. This is my secret hideout deep in the forest. I have my own garden where I plant herbs to heal injured animals. This isn't a wild bird. It even has a name. It must be someone's pet. Okay, Sky. so you like to sneak out, huh? The world out there is dangerous. I should bring you home. I followed the address on Skye's tag and took her there. Guess her owner wouldn't be happy if they thought a witch had cursed her, so it's better not to show myself. No one wants anything to do with a witch. But no matter how annoyed or scared they acted, I just don't care. Having the place to myself has its perks. But then out of the blue, a guy slumped on the chair opposite me. How dare he? I could feel his eyes peeking at me. Another idiot wanting to test his courage. Hey, Sage, right? We're in the same English literature class, but in case you didn't know, I'm Mark. Why should I know your name? Oh, I... I just wanted to... If you don't want to get diarrhea, sleep paralysis, or skin rashes, don't ever talk to me. Then I turned around to leave, but tripped over something and fell forward. You alright? This is crazy. Who asked him to do that? Then I came home to find an angry crowd in front of my house. Those eerie sounds are keeping us awake at night. What kind of dark magic are you practicing? Your black sorcery made my curling iron overheat and burn my hair. Must be some demonic influence messing around here. Turns out, strange things were happening to every house in the neighborhood. So these superstitious people blamed everything on my family and even wanted to kick us out. We can't move. We have to wait here for Leah. She's with the devil now. She's obviously not coming back. So go away. Never talk about my sister like that again. Get out of here! Coincidentally, there was a loud rumble of thunder right at that moment. Horrified, they started pointing and calling me a witch. Go home, everyone, for your own safety. I'll take it from here. This man is Mr. Thompson, the town's mayor. He came with an offer to help our family move away in peace. Believe me, it's best for everyone. If and when your daughter comes back, you'll be informed right away. 
After he left, my parents seemed to be thinking about moving away for real. What's gotten into them? We didn't do anything wrong. Why do we have to leave? I'm not going anywhere. My parents might be weak, but I'm not. I'll wait for my sister here. She promised me she'd help me care for those poor creatures. She will be back. Achoo! What was that? It sounds like a guy's sneeze? Who's there? Show yourself! Ugh, you idiot. Come out alone. Both of you. Now. Those two look familiar. Right, they're Meg and Nick, the infamous best friend duo in my school. It turns out, they were curious about the strange phenomena happening at Meg's house too. They wanted to see if I was really using witchcraft to cause all that. We didn't expect to see you healing animals here. Why do you let people think you're a witch? They can call me a witch, an alien, or whatever. I don't care, as long as they leave me be. I hate it when people annoy me, which is what you two are doing now. Quit following me and never come here again. But they didn't leave. Instead, Meg told me about a black rose that always appeared at the scene. Of course, it reminds the townsfolk of my family. Nick thought that made no sense. I mean, if it really was us, why would we make it that obvious? Hmm, someone's clearly trying to frame us. That's it. If I found that person, my family could live here in peace again. We'll investigate together. We can catch the bad guy and be heroes, like a detective squad. Sounds like you've been watching too much Scooby-Doo. And why aren't you guys scared of me? Actually, I'd make a great Daphne. And come on, we just saw you feeding the cats. Even if you are a witch, then you must be a kind one. The next day, I was going downstairs when I heard some chattering noise. Are those angry townsfolk back? I was about to scare them away, but I saw my parents warmly welcoming Meg and Nick? This is the first time I'd had friends come over, so my parents were overreacting. I hurriedly pulled my so-called friends out of the house. I guess disturbing me has become a habit to you, huh? We didn't know how else to contact you. Anyway, we'd like to introduce you to an IT expert. He's agreed to help us. Then suddenly, a guy standing behind the black rose bush appeared and said hi to me. Isn't that the guy from the library? This is Mark, the newest member of our squad. Good to see you again. I hope you'll remember my name this time. So, this Mark guy was really serious about this. He's now telling Nick how he could get data from all of the cameras in the neighborhood, which sounded like some kind of alien language to me. Look, our tech genius found something. Mark is awesome, right, Sage? Um, I guess? Um, someone hacked into these houses' networks and was causing their electrical appliances to go haywire. And every night at 11 o'clock sharp, the camera would be disconnected. Not for long, just enough for someone to place a black rose at the scene unnoticed. Can you track down that hacker's IP address? Yes, and also their coordinates. That's Clara's house? Wait, Clara? The drama queen who always plays up everything about me? Does she hate me that much to target my whole family? We reached out to Clara to talk privately, but she flat out denied everything. What is wrong with you? Did this witch hypnotize you into becoming her slave? Blink twice if you need help. <laughs> we have proof. You can't get away with this. Are you threatening me? This is illegal. I will tell my father about this. You think you're a big deal just because your father is the mayor? Big enough for you to watch out. She's the mayor's daughter? What's with that smug attitude? Everyone in this school remembers how she embarrassed herself last year after Mark rejected her. You may not know this, but Mark is the most popular guy among the girls in our school. It, um, it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in those girls. You don't have to explain yourself to me. I don't even care. The atmosphere suddenly became weirdly awkward. Well, now the only way is to stalk Clara and catch her red-handed. But we've been sitting here for an hour and nothing's happened. This snooping scheme is so silly. I was about to leave when Mark stopped me. Someone was coming out of Clara's house. Gotcha. Still trying to deny it now, Clara? Mark took off his mask, but who's this man? He suddenly flung out, then attacked Mark and ran off. We were about to chase him when Mark cried out in pain. Meg and Nick told me to take Mark home while they chased after the guy. I brought him home. Hmm, this house looks so familiar. Oh, this was the owner's house of Skye the bird I'd saved. Mark explained he'd seen me bring Sky back and was impressed with the note I'd left on how to take care of its wound. I knew everyone had been wrong about you, so I wanted to thank you and be your friend. I'm not someone who could make friends. Then I quickly left. The next day, Mark helped us arrange a meeting with Clara at the cafe where he worked. 
When Claire heard about the man coming out of her house last night, she seemed shaken and said he was probably one of her dad's staff. However, when Meg asked her for her help, Clara refused. We hit a dead end again, but Mark said he already had a solution. Before he could tell us, the cafe owner appeared and told me that spooky stuff was happening and asked me to leave. The holy statue, the town's symbol, was broken, and they found another black rose at the scene. Meg and Nick immediately jumped to my defense, but he didn't listen. He also forbade Mark from hanging out with me, or else he'd fire him. I'll leave now! See? I'm not good at making friends. I only bring them trouble. I dashed away so no one could see me cry. However, suddenly, someone's hand grabbed mine, then pulled me onto the bus just as it arrived at its stop. Mark? What are you doing? He'll fire you! I quit. That kind of boss doesn't get to fire me. It's all my fault. Don't worry. I have a ton of different jobs. Waiter, dog walker, even babysitter. Anything that makes money. What's the money for? This bus will take you to the answer. We got off at the last stop, an orphanage. So Mark was donating the money he earned to these orphans. Promise me you'll show them your true kind side. At first, I wasn't sure if I could, but then I gradually opened up to these sweet kids. Suddenly, I saw a familiar figure watching other children having fun from afar. Is that... Leah? My sister? Turns out, five years ago, a lost kid was found wandering by the bus stop. She was so scared that she couldn't remember anything about her family. She only said a few separate words like funeral or dead people, so the nuns thought her parents had passed away and took her in. During her time here, she couldn't blend in with other kids. Seeing how Leah pushes others away, I saw myself in her. She shouldn't live her life the same way I do. I then called my parents and they came to pick us up right away. Oh boy, it surely was the tearful reunion of the century. Thank you so much. We only found Leah thanks to you. I'm glad to help, but that's not all. I've got something else to show you. As it turned out, Mark bugged Clara's phone at the cafe. It recorded a call she had with her father, exposing him as the culprit behind the town's mishaps. It appears Mr. Mayor wanted to build a shopping mall, but he needed to clear up some space for it. Using my family's bad rap, he played spooky tricks on the townspeople to scare them into selling their homes for cheap. When Clara found out the truth, she begged her father to stop, but he refused to. Meg and Nick posted the recording on the internet, causing outrage among our town. The cops arrested him, and my family's name was cleared. All our neighbors apologized to my family for letting their superstitions blindside them. My parents were obviously touched, so they forgave them all, and threw a party. So my family was reunited. Not only did I find my sister, but also three good friends. Well, maybe two good friends, and one more than just a friend. Hey, I'm Lydia. It might seem like this enchanting forest is real, but it's even better. It's VR, and you're looking at its creator. This is nature at its most perfect form, unpolluted, a home to many wild creatures. Those are actually my friend's avatars. One of them is Layla, my best friend, my only real life friend. All the kids used to think I was a freak for my obsession with plants and nature. Then I met Layla, who was also a nature geek in the neighborhood. I knew right away that she and I were going to be best of friends. We love all the same weird things, like pickled garlic and growing peppers to make pepper spray. We were basically inseparable, and with Layla by my side, I couldn't care less about what the other kids said anymore. But my world suddenly turned upside down when Layla graduated high school and had to move out for college. Saying goodbye filled me with sadness and fear. Layla was my only friend, and I would feel lost without her. So she came up with the idea of using VR to keep me company. Little did I know, it completely changed my life. VR opened a whole new world for me, giving me the tools to build the land of my dreams, a place where Layla and I could hang out and explore nature the way we used to. Soon enough, I quickly got a grasp on VR and became a big name player in the game. Before long, my life was more virtual than reality. Suddenly, everything was black. I took off the VR headset and mom and dad were standing at the door. Why are you still here? It's the middle of the school day, for God's sake. You've had your head buried in that game since your junior year. Enough is enough. You know what? We've been too easy on her. You need to get into a college at the end of the school year, or we will kick you out of this house. Then how am I supposed to play VR? You know it's my life. Not my problem. You're 18. It's time for you to grow up and face reality. Mom! I'm with your dad on this. Now hurry up and get to school. 
Later, I reached out to Layla for help. Why don't you apply to my college? Huh, that seems like a good idea. I'd get to see you in person again, right? You'll be out of your parents' reach, and it's an easy school to get into. They just need your high school transcript. Simple. Girl, say no more. Sign me in. Months passed, and it was finally college admission day. Man, it is packed here. Where could I find the school garden? There it is. But where's Layla? There was only a boy sitting here reading a book. He was literally glowing in the sunshine. He suddenly looked up and our eyes met. Ah, oh, that was so awkward. Lydia! Oh my god, I'm so glad you're here. Finally, we've reunited after two years. Layla, I missed you too. I, oh, you look different. The girl standing in front of me was totally dolled up from top to toes. What happened to her? Oh, you know, I found my style ever since I got here. Don't worry, I'll help you out with your style too. But I like my style. Anyway, do you know what major you're in? I haven't decided yet. Better hurry up. Our school has a rule. To stay here, you have to choose a major within your first week. But no biggie, just go to my department. Greenhouse. I'm the class president now. Come on, I'll show you around. Then, Layla led me to her department infrastructure, and I was absolutely impressed. It was equipped with modern experiment and technology and exotic plants. Right then, a group of students swept past me and flocked around Layla. She introduced them as her new friends, but they just gave me the screening from head to toe, then straight up ignored me. Ugh, rude. Whatever, I need some alone VR time anyway. I put on the headset and doing some boxing moves, but accidentally knocked over something in real life. Layla, why is your friend wearing the VR thing and breaking our stuff? Don't you dare tell me she's from VR. No, no, no. She just uses VR since she's socially anxious. I'll talk to her. Lydia, listen, if you're going to become a greenhouse major, you have to lay off the VR a little bit. You can't be carrying the headset around campus, okay? I confusedly nodded my head. Isn't she also playing VR with me all the time, though? Afterwards, I went to get settled into my dorm room to find a girl playing my fave VR motorcycle race while riding her hoverboard. She's good, but I'm the boss of this game. Instantly, I joined the race and quickly passed her. But man, this girl was fierce. We ended up reaching the finish line at the same time. Whoa, that was epic! I'm Lydia, by the way. It's my first day and I'm assigned to this room. You must be my roommate? Yep, I'm Christine, class president of the VR department. You seem to know VR really well. How long have you been playing? I'm kinda new. Just started two years ago. Sheesh, you've got games, girl. Wanna join our department? The next day, Christine showed me around the VR department, which was full of the newest techs. Dude, this is so sick! Every week, we have an exhibition of new VR technology, and we mainly work and interact in VR. No need for awkward real-life convo. Besides, our department also joined the school annual creativity competition for the huge prize of $10,000, which we could use to develop more modern VR technology. Whoa! This place was heaven! Just imagine playing VR all day, every day! Holy moly, can it be soccer shots enhanced? I joined in the game immediately and gave it a big kick, scoring a goal. Wait, did I break the pots again? I took off my headset to see a guy doubled over in pain. Oh god, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, I'm good, I'm fine. His face seemed awfully familiar. Oh, I remember you from the school garden the other day. Yeah, that was me. I'm Marshall. Thinking about applying to VR? Yeah, I'm Lydia. Lydia, I think you'd like it here. I suddenly felt my face getting hot when I was saved by a phone call from Layla. I quickly excused myself and ran right into her. Hey, I've been looking everywhere for you. There's a welcome party tonight and you're definitely going. N no, no party. Oh, come on. I'll introduce you to our research group. You've heard about the creativity competition for departments, right? Greenhouse is in it to win it. But no buts. Let's get ready. At the party, Layla dragged me to where the greenhouse kids were hanging out. They were still glaring at me. I should just leave, but on my way out, I bumped into Marshall. Hey, Lydia, I was looking for you. You dropped this handkerchief back at the VR department. It's from your grandma, right? Oh, my God, thank you. But how come you know it's my grandma's? Uh, um, I just guess. I... I saw your initials on it. Hey, back off, you VR freaks! Stop talking with our new member! Poof, are you sure? This morning she seemed really fond of all our gizmos and gadgets. What are you talking about? Lydia, explain this! What's there to explain? Your pea brain can't read between the lines, huh? Layla lunged at Christine and a fistfight broke out between them. That's why I don't fit in in social gatherings. Hey, wanna get out of here? Yes, please. Marshall explained that there was beef between the VR and greenhouse departments. They were neck and neck for many things, especially the scholarship competition. But sometimes, both went too far. The greenhouse put insects in the VR facility rooms, which chewed up all their cables. 
To get back at them, the VR messed with the water system in the greenhouse, which caused water blackout and killed dozens of plants. And naturally, the presidents, Layla and Christine, were always at each other's throats. Shoot, I was planning on choosing VR as my major, but that would mean turning myself into her enemy. What am I supposed to do? I tried turning back to VR to take my mind off things, but I could hardly concentrate. Lydia, why is your head stuck in the clouds? I've been thinking. I want to be in the VR department. Greenhouse is good, but I'm not sure it's for me. I just don't want us to be enemies. It's okay. We're still friends no matter what you decide. Just follow what feels good in your heart. Aw, she'd put me above all her rivalries? She hadn't changed so much after all. First thing the next morning, I went to apply to the VR department, then caught sight of Layla. Hey, Layla! I made my decision. I've applied for VR department. What? You can't be serious! Choosing VR would mean you're just throwing away your dream and living in an unreal fantasy. Unreal? It's more real than the cool girl with hot friends thing you've got going. And why would you tell me to follow my heart when you clearly didn't think I should? I, I told you that? I nodded my head, confused. I might have slipped my tongue or something. Just think about it again. Something was off. I swear she really seemed genuine yesterday. Over day, I got back to my dorm room only to find out my headset cracked and wouldn't turn on. Who did this? Freaked out, I only thought of one person who could help me fix it now. Marshall. It would take a few days to fix it. Oh no, I couldn't pass a day without VR. <laughs> I think you'll find something to do. Like what? You're more than welcome to hang here. Dang, this guy's cheeky. Suddenly Marshall's phone rang and he excused himself for a few minutes. I looked around his room and noticed two VR headsets on the table. Maybe Marshall wouldn't bother if I borrowed a spare set, right? As it turned on, my own forest appeared in front of me. Was he following me? I clicked on his profile to see. He was logged in as Layla, my friend Layla. So the Layla I've been talking to was not the real Layla, but Marshall? How long had this been going on? And did Marshall know me from the beginning? Lydia? I took off the headset to see Marshall standing there, stunned. What's this? Explain to me now. It all started when I got my department's pricey drone stuck on the roof of the greenhouse building. Layla was up there, so I begged her to give it back to me. She only agreed under one condition, that I had to use her VR account to play with you, without telling you that. At first, I only did it as part of the deal, but after a while, I find her the funniest, smartest, and most creative girl, and I couldn't help but spending time with you. You're telling me that this whole year I've been talking to someone I thought was my best friend, but it was actually just some random guy, and you have the nerve to keep lying to me? Marshall, give me my VR, and stop hovering around Lydia or she's gonna find out. She already did. Lydia, I can explain. Was it because of the stupid rivalry between Greenhouse and VR? What's so important about it that you had to lie to your best friend? You've changed, Layla, and I don't think you're my friend anymore. I stormed off, fighting back tears. I couldn't look at either of them any longer. When I got back to my dorm, Christine was already there. I asked her about my VR headset. I actually saw that Layla around our room earlier. She must have done it. That was a low move, Layla. But I was too fed up with her to even be mad. The greenhouse department could be trying to sabotage us again. Now, this is war. I'm going to gather everyone so we can plan our counterattack. Whatever, this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. On my first VR free day, I was the only person in my class without their headset. Even the professors engaged through VR. All I could do was sit and stare at people, which reminded me of those lonely days before Layla came into my life. The next few days kept on repeating themselves, until one day, my body started boiling, and my head was buzzing like it was full of bees. Professor, I'm not feeling well. I need to go back to my dorm. But he didn't flinch one bit. No one did, except this guy. Hey, need an aspirin? He extended out his hand, but there was nothing there. A virtual pill? Seriously? No, it doesn't work. Aw oh, man, bummer. I tried getting up, but my body grew heavy and weak. I kept calling Christine across the room, but no use. If only Layla was here to help me right now. No, Lydia. You can do this on your own. I leaned on the wall to prop myself up slowly, made my way back to the dorm. I was so close, but my knees trembled and I collapsed. Just then, someone came to scoop me into their arms and picked me up. I woke up in a bad headache to see Marshall cooling it down with a damp towel. Hey, you're awake. Here, have some soup and take some medicine. What are you doing here? I came to return your VR but saw you collapsing, so then I helped you into bed. I know you don't want to talk to me right now, but this was urgent, so thank you, Marshall. 
I threw myself into his arms and burst into tears. I thought no one was gonna help me. He wrapped his arms around me, and I finally felt safe. The next day, thanks to Marshall, I felt loads better, so I went to watch the department's creativity contest. The greenhouse presented their newly bred plant species and got the highest score so far. VR, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. Our newest development in headsets, uh, exploded. Christine didn't take it well. I tried to comfort her, but she just brushed me off and stormed away. Suddenly, Layla rushed towards me and pulled me into a corner. Lydia, I just want to say I'm sorry. Ever since I got here, I became the center of attention in the VR department. And I got so wrapped up in it. I had to give up playing VR with you. I don't know, Layla. Why couldn't you just tell me that? I didn't want you to be alone. You were always online, so I guess you didn't make any friends back home. That's true. This might sound ridiculous, but only now have I realized that VR isn't everything. No virtual reality can replace the real world. And real friendship goes through all kinds of ups and downs. But it lasts, just like you and I. I'm glad you realized that. And I just want to let you know, no matter what department you choose, I'll support you. Unconditionally. Thanks. But hey, why did you break my VR headset, though? Your VR? No, I didn't do it. I swear. Then how come Christine blamed it on you? I ran down to my dorm to confront Christine, but she wasn't there, and she didn't return for the rest of the night. When I got to class the next day, I put on my headset and found the rest of the department ragging on me, calling me a liar and a traitor. Somehow, pictures of me and Layla talking yesterday were plastered all over the virtual world. The audacity of you to come back here. We already know the greenhouse department is using you to spy on us. It was you who messed with our invention at the department contest. Otherwise, how could it explode? They started booing and surrounding me, so I ran for my life. Until a hand grabbed mine. You could run for real, you know. Ah, uh, yes. At least I'm not the only one virtually running. We made it to the building's entrance, just as the greenhouse student dragging Christine towards us, and the VR students caught up with us. Layla, what's going on? We caught this girl starting a fire in our greenhouse lab with her hoverboard, then tried to flee the scene. What? Why would you do that? It's not on purpose, okay? Then tell us the truth. Now. Fine. So, a day before the department's competition, I secretly made an adjustment to the VR model. But somehow, it caused an error and we ended up losing the prize. I was so mad that I decided to take it out on this greenhouse bunch. Last night, I snuck into your lab, trying to take away all of your research. But suddenly, my hoverboard overheated and exploded, causing a fire to spread everywhere. I freaked out and left. You know the rest? Yeah, thanks to you, our lab was burnt to the ground. You're lucky no one got hurt. And you had the nerve to blame Lydia for losing the contest. I had to, otherwise the entire department is on to me. Oh, not just the VR department. Now everyone was furious at this crazy manipulative witch. What about my VR headset? Did you break it too? Well, that's just a little trick to get you and Layla to fight. You do belong to VR department after all. That means no making friends with Greenhouse. Right, guys? Guys? You've gone too far this time, Christine. And this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. Look where it got you. The VR students couldn't have agreed more. They immediately voted to impeach Christine from her class president role before turning her into the administration. They then apologized on Christine's behalf and offered to help the Greenhouse rebuild their lab. Of course, Layla and the Greenhouse department agreed. It looked like the start of a beautiful partnership. Within a few months, in collaboration with the VR department, the greenhouse was completely remodeled and renovated. No one even cared to mention the feud between the two departments anymore. And guess what? I applied for a second major in greenhouse. Double majoring was tough, but I had the support of Layla and Marshall and our friends in both departments. Speaking of Marshall, he wanted to take me somewhere special in the real world. He covered my eyes and led me there. Now you can look. I could have sworn I was in the VR world, but I wasn't. I could feel and smell the flowers, the soft grass, and Marshall's warm hand holding mine. Lydia, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. <clears throat> I don't want to be your virtual friend, or even a friend in real life. I wanted more, so would you like to be my girlfriend? Are you kidding me? Yes, yes, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Oh my, look at those dudes over there. It's so true that all men are the same. All it takes is seeing some pretty girls and their eyes immediately light up. I was about to ignore these jerks, but then this couple walked in holding hands. Instantly, the jerks started making a fuss. Ew, look! That's gross! Then they pretended to retch. Jeez, these idiots needed to keep their outdated views to themselves. Well done, guys. You've just booked yourself the 99th place on the playbook.
<laughs> Let me show you my playbook. In here, you'll find all types of men, from nerds, potboys, jocks, and successful businessmen. But they all have one thing in common. They are all bad. Hi, I'm Monica, and I'm a playgirl who was trained to take revenge on men. Since I was little, I was taught that all men are bad, and it's my duty as a woman to teach them a lesson, especially homophobes and womanizers. Now all that's missing is the 100th prey? Then done! Hey sis, family meeting now! Oops, duty called. Mom's gonna reveal our final mission. Now, where are my books and pens? <laughs> yeah, those two are my colleagues and also my competitors. There's Cindy, my impulsive little sister, and next to her is Grace, my older, super smart, and slightly more mature sister. As for me, I'm something in between. Not as childish as Cindy, but not as calm and collected as Grace. Oh, here's Mom. Okay, let's get to the point. So this is it. The last goal. And it's the biggest one yet. So, this time you're not working together, but on your own. This target won't be easy, but you all have your own charms, and I have every faith in you all. And the time starts... now! Hmm, Dennis Groff. Dennis Groff. Let's see. Oh, he's quite handsome. The son of a CEO, and super rich. Hmm, it figures he's a lady killer, duh! But why did Mom assign him to us? I mean, she usually just lets us set our own goals. Also. Why do we have to compete against each other? Maybe it was because it was the 100th target, so she was making it extra challenging? We all love mom and want to please her. I mean, who doesn't want to be the last one to complete the family playbook, right? I stayed up all night making a plan of action. Hmm, from my social media stalking, I found out that Dennis's friend was having birthday celebrations at a bar in town tomorrow night. So, the next evening, I put on the sexiest red dress that I've bought for this specific occasion and walked confidently into the bar. All eyes were on me, except Dennis's. Excuse me? Was he going to the bar for free Wi-Fi or what? Seeing that, I took a glass of wine and gently approached him. But suddenly, a strange guy came out of nowhere and pulled my hand back. Honey, where are you going? Have a drink with me? Get out of the way! I'm busy! I was about to turn my attention back to my prey when... Oops! The strange guy tripped me up, causing me to stumble onto the ground. This was so embarrassing. I guess I'd just have to call it a night. <sighs> but suddenly, an arm appeared in front of me. I looked up and... Hey, it was... Dennis? I was a bit surprised, but quickly regained my confidence and let him help me up. After that, he offered to buy me a drink, and then we ended up chatting into the early hours. And Jackpot! Turned out he's as big of a golf lover as I was, so I persuaded him to join a golf club with me. Ain't that a smart move? A week later, and it was progress report day. One by one, we told Mom what we'd done so far. Cindy tried hard to approach Dennis by coming to the billiard hall that he frequented, and being the typical impulsive kid that she is, she bombarded Dennis with messages on social networks. She seems to be quite optimistic, though, as Dennis responded to her quite friendly, and the two kind of vibed when it came to Billards. As for Grace, she applied for the position of assistant manager at Dennis's company. I know. Man, my sister is a genius. She even said that she already felt some chemistry going on, as he wouldn't take his eyes off of her. Mom seemed impressed with the progress we'd made so far. Everyone's attained certain achievements, but sure thing, I was still in the lead. I felt it. I don't know if I'm being delusional, but Dennis and I were getting so close, and he had also shown some gestures of concern for me. Hmm. Anyway, it appears that I'll have to work even harder than I first thought to win this one. Yeah, I did used to wonder if what Mom always said about men was 100% true, and why my sisters and I had to do all this. Until one day, back when I was 16, that day, I was going into my mom's room to borrow some jewelry for catfishing when I found an open notebook on the ground. Curious, I picked it up and discovered it was mom's diary. And it was in a tragic story. She once fell deeply in love with a man, 
but then ran into him with someone else. Worse, she didn't even have a chance to confront him. Instead, she got his message right away. I knew the truth already. You're not a real woman. We're over. Not a real woman was what that Nick called my mom. Ridiculous. Just because my mom is a transgender? She did not go through all this pain and heartache to be disrespected like that. My mom's life was tragic, like a movie. Curiously, I flipped through it all from the beginning, and my heart felt like it's actually breaking, finding out what mom had been through. Turned out, she and Nick were part of a group of three back in high school, alongside Maureen. Nick and Maureen were a couple, so my mom, as Jack at that time, had to keep her love from Nick a secret and poured it all into this diary. Unfortunately, Maureen found out her secret and exposed it to the whole school, which made everyone make fun of my mom and she had to leave in shame. After so many years, she was still not able to forget Nick, so she decided to do the trans surgery to return to find him and fight for her love. They had some happy months together, but on that one disastrous day, she found out that he cheated on her. And it was with none other than Maureen. Harsh. How can people be so cruel to each other like that? Mom was a good person. And thanks to her, orphans like Cindy, Grace, and I could have a home. I owed so much to her, which is why I was desperate to succeed at her last mission and to make her happy. Back to the mission. Everything was going great between me and Dennis. He took me to the golf club and out for dinner. For a rich businessman type, I had to admit that he wasn't all stern and serious. Actually, he was a lot of fun to be around. Then, when he dropped me off after a date, he touched my hand and said, Monica, I'm really enjoying getting to know you, and I would like it very much if you would come and have dinner with my family tomorrow. Whoa, this was great! I mean, this project would be way easier now I had an open invite to scope out his family. <laughs> No. What is this feeling? I had butterflies in my stomach, and my palms were sweaty. It must just be the thrill of meeting Dennis's family. Right? But why couldn't I stop thinking about his cute laugh and his dreamy eyes? Oh no, I think I might have... actual feelings for him. From then on, I found myself wanting to scream and throw stuff at Cindy and Grace every time I heard them bragging about how close they were getting to Dennis. I'm crazy, aren't I? Now what? Am I the predator or the prey? <sighs> OMG, I'm so nervous, I literally can't stop shaking. Whoa, they looked so wealthy and classy. His parents were both really sweet, and I soon felt a lot more relaxed. We had dinner, and the conversation flowed easily. There was just one thing that kept bothering me. His dad's name is Nick? Surely this was a coincidence, right? I mean, Nick's a popular name. Something didn't sit right with me, so I knew I needed to say something to Mom. I anxiously walked back and forth until I heard her car pull up outside. Mom, is... is Dennis's father... that man? She looked stunned, then slowly sat down, sighed, and told me everything. Just like I thought, she picked Dennis to be the 100th target, or more like a bait, just to take revenge on Nick. Furthermore, she wanted us to use Dennis to make Nick go bankrupt. But what did Dennis do? If you have a problem with Nick, then talk to him. Why drag his innocent son into it? Mom and I were having a heated argument when Cindy and Grace approached. What's wrong with you? Stop being so smitten. Mom just wants to use us as tools for personal revenge, and she doesn't love us at all. Don't be so insolent. I see that you're letting your emotions screw up your decision. Nick treated our mom badly, so his son deserves to pay the price for this. You know how much pain he caused, Mom? Don't you want to fight for her? Wow, you totally suck and are an awful person. I couldn't stay here and listen to any more of this, so I rushed out of there and went and stayed with my friend. I have no idea what I'm meant to do now. One thing's for sure. I can't go through with Mom's revenge plan anymore. Maybe I should go find Nick and ask him to sit down with Mom and talk things through. Unfortunately, I underestimated my sisters. As I was scrolling through my phone when I saw a post from Cindy, 
Exposing Dennis as a womanizing jerk who dated three girls at the same time. As proof, she'd inserted pictures of Dennis with each of us. Trust her to do something so childish. It gets worse, as Grace linked up with a hacker to splatter the company's website with things like Mr. Nick Groff, the president of Groff Corporation, is a liar, traitor, and homophobe. This media crisis has caused the whole company to suffer, and now Dennis was avoiding my calls. I was hovering my finger over the call button when at that precise moment, Grace texted me. Hey sis, you better not miss the sacred moment we tick off number 100 in the playbook. The mission is over anyway. Let's just go home and make up. Mom's waiting. No way was I going to let them do this. So I immediately called Dennis and left an urgent voicemail, telling him that he needed to get his father and go around to my house ASAP. As I led them inside, Mr. Groff and Mom's eyes all widened when seeing each other. Nick stood there frozen, while Mom just asked him to leave immediately. But eventually, I managed to convince them to all sit down and sort this mess out. Jean, I worked out straight away that you were Jack. I was shocked at first, but then I realized it didn't matter, as I truly loved you. So I just wanted to wait until you were ready to tell me. You knew it? Impossible! We used to be very close friends. It's really not difficult for me to recognize Jack's habits. Besides, your face still retains some of the old features. Whatever. But I saw you with that snake, Maureen. And you even had the cheek to break up with me through one cynical text. Do you know how much pain I had to suffer to pursue you? Nick looked genuinely confused. Then things slowly revealed themselves. So Maureen was the one who sent that cruel message on that day. When she found out about my mom and Nick, she investigated and discovered that mom was actually Jack. That day at the coffee house, she begged Nick to take her back, but he refused so she made up some excuse to borrow Nick's phone, then sent that message to break them apart. My mom sat there in shocked silence. I guess she was processing the fact that she took revenge on the wrong person, and now she'd caused problems for two innocent people. I'm so sorry. I let my emotions overrule me and make me bitter. I promise I will put this right. I am Jean Wilkins, a transgender woman and Nick Groff's ex. I thought he betrayed me, and this made me turn into an angry version of myself, who became blinded by my desire for revenge. Only, I was wrong. You see, it's impossible that Nick has any ill will toward the LGBT community, because he loved me. As for his son, Dennis, he's a good man who got caught up in the crossfire. He's never cheated on anyone, so please don't judge him for something he hasn't done. As I watched the video, I felt immensely proud of my brave mom. She'd made a lot of mistakes, but she'd publicly owned up to them, which took a lot of courage. Thankfully, the video worked. Nick's company has recovered, and Dennis's name was cleared. So, what happens next? Well, me and my sisters apologized to Dennis and Nick. Luckily, they are both very kind and understanding guys. Mom doesn't hold grudges against men anymore, and she's even started dating this lovely man named Jacob. Cindy met this sweet girl called Beverly, who, thinking about it, is pretty much her opposite, but they're actually kind of cute together. Grace is still single and focusing on her career. And me? I will never touch this ever again, because I'm sticking with this prey forever. Here I am at a press conference, standing in front of countless reporters. Oh, no, no, that's not me. There you go. I'm Alexia, 17 years old. I may look like a high schooler, but unlike kids my age, I'm a bodyguard. How so? Well, I was adopted by an underground security organization after being abandoned at a young age. Thankfully, Papa, my savior, was around to teach me everything from math to martial arts. Honestly, it was the happiest time of my life but he'd gone too soon due to cancer, and it's like I was abandoned again. 
didn't leave me any time to grieve, the organization put me on training from dusk till dawn, saying I needed to make my papa proud. So I always tried my best and stayed on top at martial arts. However, due to my clumsiness, I ended up as just a bodyguard for VIPs with a codename 036. How boring. <sighs> Until one day, I was summoned by the boss. 036, we have a special task for you. His name is David Smith, principal of Woodport High School. Another dull escort, again. <sighs> You will investigate Mr. Smith for a financial regulation violation by disguising as a new student at Woodford and collect everything related to him, his wife, and daughter. So be extremely careful. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Finally. Goodbye, boring bodyguard job. Time to prove myself. I'll make Papa proud. And to be honest, I'm also excited to experience the life of a high schooler. Now, I needed to do some shopping. Since I only have suits to wear on duty, I didn't know how to dress like a real student. Oh wow, look at all these dazzling clothes. After a lot of contemplating, I decided to take this pretty dress. This thing, and also these. They're matching, right? But the saleswoman asked me if they were for my little sister. Huh? What did she mean? Then she picked out something else for me. I was about to try it on when a scream startled me. Help! Thief! Help! Ugh, not a single day went by without trouble. I bolted in that direction and... Aha! Not today, thief! Are you crazy? I'm not the thief. Let me go. Just then, I heard a thud and saw another man in blue being tackled to the ground by two security guards, while a woman snatched the bag out of his hands. Oops, I just caught the wrong guy. I immediately released him. Turned out he was chasing the thief too, but no matter how much I apologized, he kept rambling that I was a violent lunatic and even suspected me of being an accomplice. This guy was unbelievable. He better wish he'd never see me again, else the next kick won't be a mistake. Today is my first day at school. My disguise was so good, even I couldn't recognize myself. There's no way I'd get caught. From now on, I'll go by the name Alexia. Much better than 036, isn't it? Wait, I know her. Bella Smith, one of my objects. <laughs> wow, the audacity of those girls to pick on their own principal's daughter. All right, Alexia's coming to your rescue. But not in my normal way. So, here comes a clumsy nerd who accidentally bumped into them, spilling coffee over them, buying time for the prey to run away. The mean girls let out horrified yelps, then yelled at me before running to the restroom. <laughs> Then, I turned to see Bella talking to a boy. Oh no, it wasn't just any boy. It was that obnoxious jerk from the mall. What are the odds? Then, they headed toward me. While Bella kept thanking me, I caught a staring look from this guy. You seem familiar. Have we met before? No, nope. no way. How's that possible? It's my first day here. Phew, he seemed not to recognize me. So, he's Clark, Bella's best friend. Now how am I supposed to approach her when her company was this guy? <sighs> Anyways, my first class is about to start. Now excuse me, I have this perfect cover of a schoolgirl that I need to keep up. Newbie, tell me, where was the American Declaration of Independence signed? Um, at the bottom of the paper, madam? The whole class burst into laughter. How embarrassing! But how was I supposed to know? Papa didn't teach me this. Then suddenly, I heard this alarming sound. Don't panic. I'll handle this. Follow me to the hallway. But no one did. Instead, they laughed even louder. I was still dumbfounded when a nice girl told me it's just an end-of-class bell. Oh, that's what it was. Finally, a break from all those exhausting lessons. Now let's check if the food is safe. Okay, pass. I was about to eat the carrot. Then the mean girls from earlier appeared. Yes, eat it. That'll help your poor eyesight. And this is for staining my dress. Then they strutted off. Ugh. In other places, those folks would have known the taste of my fist. Hey, Alexia. Alexia. So noisy. This place is like a beehive. Alexia. Oh, wait. That's my new name. I turned around to see Bella. She wanted to join me for lunch. Here comes the chance. But nope. The tagalong clerk is also here. Jeez. Uh, I asked Bella why those mean girls teased her, the principal's daughter, but she just shook her head unknowingly. Hmm, but I think I've kind of figured out the reason after talking with her. 
I noticed that she was a bit slower than her peers, as when I cracked a joke, it took her a while to understand and laugh along. So, prying out information from her should be easy. If only... You've just moved here. How do you know she's the principal's daughter? Uh, uh, I heard from others. This party pooper. Jeez. <sighs> the first week didn't go too well, as I was still getting used to being called Alexia and not inspecting my own locker. Also, this load of homework? In general, I enjoy learning stuff at school, but the mission hasn't progressed one bit. I had to pick up the pace, so using the voice changer, I tricked Mr. Smith to leave his office, then sneaked in there. But suddenly, Bella came in. Panicking, I blurted out I was cleaning the desk for the principal. She seemed convinced and even joined me. Another time, I saw the principal talking to someone in the hallway and was about to take pictures with my spy camera pen when Clark appeared and bombarded me with stupid questions. Jesus Christ, if things carried on like this, when on earth would I finish my mission? One day, I spotted Bella in trouble with the mean girls again. Ugh, do these brats ever learn? This is too much. I need to settle this once and for all. So I ran over and quickly pulled Bella away, telling her to run. Then, I threw my famous flying kicks, along with some front sweeps, and got all the meanies knocked on the ground in a blink. Justice served. <laughs> I dusted my hands together in triumph, but has Clark just witnessed everything? This guy was way too suspicious. He probably would ruin my secret mission someday. I need to look into this guy. And it didn't take long for me to find out he wasn't from a wealthy family like most of the other students. He got into this prestigious school on a scholarship for being brainy. Now here I was in Clark's family's bakery. Oh, this girl has his eyes and hair color. We talked and immediately clicked. She was Enola, Clark's sister. She has Down syndrome, but she's a real talent. Look, aren't her designs stunning? I was flipping through Enola's sketchbook when Clark suddenly showed up and dragged me outside. Why did you follow me here? I know you're up to something. Who is the suspicious one here? It's you who always coincidentally appears wherever I am. I only followed you here because you've been stalking me and looking shady. That got Clark speechless. Then his sister came to us saying, Uh, Alexia, Enola really likes playing with you. Brother, let her come inside. His attitude completely changed hearing that. He gently told me that other people often tease Enola because of her condition. He also apologized for misunderstanding me and offered me a free cinnamon swirl. Wasn't this the first time I'd seen him smile? I'd never been so close to him like this. And suddenly, I felt something turning in my stomach. Perhaps I'd eaten too much. <laughs> After that, our conflict was naturally settled. Me and Clark became closer and I got to know other aspects of him. He was really gentle and helpful. The more we talked, the more flutters I felt. Oh no, what's wrong with me? Worse still, I even started to feel uncomfortable when Bella was close to Clark. He always helps her with the smallest things, like opening the door, holding an umbrella for her, and even opening water bottles. She always overacted as if she wanted Clark to protect her all the time. No, get yourself together, Alexia. No, 036, you have a mission to do. So, I faked having period cramps to get out of PE and sneak into Mr. Smith's office again. I rummaged through the trash can, but there's nothing useful. Then I noticed a locked drawer. And guess what? There was a notepad and an envelope full of money. Then by shading the paper with a pencil, the letters gradually appeared. It's an address and a time. So the principal's going to make a transaction there? Got it. Then on the way out, I clumsily knocked over a pile of documents on his desk. Wait. There was a picture of a woman holding two babies with scribbles. I'll love you three forever. But Bella told me she was an only child. Then who's this? And here's that place. The middle of nowhere. Exactly where something fishy would happen. 429. It's almost time. Someone's coming. Wait. It's the woman in that picture. She's older, but it's definitely her. And then Principal Smith appeared. They seemed really close. They'd been talking and he handed her an envelope. That envelope? So she was his. What now? Haven't given up on stalking others. Okay, listen carefully. I think Principal Smith is involved in a financial violation case. But not just that. I just got him two-timing. See? N no way. That's my... Okay, I will keep this secret for you on one condition. Let me join this investigation. 
The principal has been supportive of my scholarship. I don't think he's that type of person. What? He wanted to work with me? That sounded risky, but as long as I kept my mouth shut about the organization, I could spend some Bella free time with him. Good, right? A few days later, Clark told me to meet him at a cafe to discuss the investigation. But it's been ages and he still hasn't shown up. Then out of nowhere, a beautiful cake was presented in front of my eyes. Oh my, it's Clark, singing happy birthday and even gave me a present. Birthday? I myself didn't know when my birthday was. Why he... And the cake, did he make it himself for me? Aw, he's so sweet. I got so emotional that I almost blurted out my feelings to him. But right at that moment, Bella, out of the blue, jumped in between us. Typical Bella, never leave us alone. Turns out, she was actually the one to insist her dad let her see my student records and make my first birthday cake ever. Thank you guys, I've never had a birthday before because I have no, uh, no, because my parents are always away. Then we should celebrate properly at your house, how about that? What? Why did he suggest that? But then Clark winked at me. Heh, <laughs> seems like we had a plan. Arriving at her home, we were warmly greeted by Bella's parents. It was such a delicious home-cooked meal. So this was what it was like to have a family. Bella had this all the time? But poor her. She didn't know about her father's a cheater. <sighs> we were in the middle of dinner when Clark asked Mr. Smith about a science project he was doing. Then Clark winked at me again. That's my cue. So I excused myself to use the restroom, then sneaked into Mr. Smith's office. This pen was magical. Let's see what Bella's dear father was hiding. Oh, he withdrew the same amount of money each month. Yay! Today was a success! Thanks to Clark's clever plan, I would finally got something useful. Suddenly, our eyes met and he looked at me gently while leaning closer. I was ready for a kid when my boss called me. I did not assign this mission for you to play house with that criminal. You have three days, or else I'll have someone more capable taking care of this. Such a waste of your papa's expectation. Am I really that useless? Thinking I'd let papa down, I couldn't help but burst into tears. What happened? Who's that? Tell me. I'll handle him. Clark, it may sound weird, but I'm actually a spy. A uh, what? Clark was shocked, obviously, so we sat down on a bench and I blurted out everything to him. Clark didn't say a word and just gently held me in his arms, which made me feel so relieved. You may wonder why Bella and I were in this deserted place. The thing is, a few days after that call, my boss ordered me to bring Bella here to kidnap her and use the documents I gathered to blackmail the principal into resigning. I guess that could help me get rid of the third wheel Bella and have Clark all to myself, right? Oh, isn't that our school's vice president? So he was behind everything after all. Then suddenly, freeze, hands in the air. Oh my god, the police? Why were they here? Along with Mr. Smith and Clark? We're so doomed. Except it was my master plan. After receiving the text from my boss, I almost followed his order. But then, I remembered Papa's words. He always told me to never lose my moral compass and never harm others to achieve personal goals. Bella was a good person and shouldn't be punished for whatever her father did. I couldn't betray my first friend like that. So I told Clark and we set up a plan to find out who was behind all this. And here we are. The vice principal was revealed to have hired my organization to spy on the principal to overthrow him. And when he couldn't find any dirt on Mr. Smith, he turned to use Bella as a leverage against her father. How despicable. Also, I can't believe that the new boss led our organization down an evil path like that. But it's not the only truth revealed. But Principal Smith, how do you explain your monthly money withdrawal? I had a close friend who unfortunately passed away at a young age. He asked me to send his money to his illegitimate son and daughter, whom he'd kept a secret due to family pressure. So there's nothing more going on between you and my mom, right? Huh? What did his mother have to do with this? Turns out the woman he met up with the other day was Clark's mom. That means Clark and Enola were the kids in the picture? What a twist! In that case, thank you for taking care of my family all this time. How foolish of me to suspect you and mom, and even investigate you. My apologies. You... you investigated him before? Yes, 
Actually, it's not a coincidence that I caught you spying on him. Sorry for keeping secrets, but I knew with your impulsive nature, you'd jump to conclusions and approach my mom. Huh? Impulsive? That's how he saw me? Then um, he knew me pretty well. <laughs> Why is everything so confusing? Can you explain it to me? Did you befriend me just to investigate my dad? Bella, I'm so sorry for how things went down, but please believe me, our friendship is real. Fortunately, Bella was understanding, and we remained good friends. Oh, actually, good sisters, because the principal adopted me after I left the organization. <laughs> and I still visit the bakery often to hang out with Enola. Enola is so lucky to have a brother who takes care of her. I wish I could have one. No, sorry, I can't do that. Why? Because I'll take care of you in a different way. Lisa! Lisa! Wait up! I slowed down, then turned around and smiled at Emily as she hurried to catch up with me. Well, spit it out. What hot tea do you get this time? Lisa, you are not going to believe this. Eden likes you. I raised an eyebrow. Huh? You're kidding, right? No! She furiously shook her head. It's true. Yesterday afternoon, after school, I passed by the basketball court, and I overheard the boys talking about it. Um, I think the likelihood is you heard wrong, my friend. As I continued on my way to school, I couldn't stop thinking about Emily's words, as if Eden Woodson, the most popular boy in the entire school, would like me? Impossible! Um, had we even spoken to each other? Oh yeah. Once, in the library, he asked to borrow my pen. <sighs> Not to mention, his last girlfriend, Sarah, was the captain of the cheerleading squad. So, yep, you can already tell how pretty and popular she was. They only split up because she moved away. Well, look at me. Talent? Well, my coordination is zero. Thanks to being short-sighted. Pretty? Nope. And my Coke bottle glasses don't help in this department. The only thing I was okay at was studying, which is why I was assigned the role of class president. Think fast. A cheerleader versus a class president? See? Figured. Throughout the day, Emily wouldn't quit insisting that what she'd heard was correct. Ugh. I know she meant well, but didn't she realize how humiliating this was for me? Even if she did hear Eden say that, he was probably just kidding around. Emily, please stop. I just want to take these tests to Mrs. Pierce's classroom, then go home. But Lisa... I gave her my best, I'm being serious look, so she let out a defeated sigh. Nodded, then walked away from me. Finally. Peace at last. I dropped the tests off, then as I was walking back along the corridor, I saw Eden leaning against his locker as he talked to a boy on the basketball team. Hmm. For some reason, curiosity got the best of me, so instead of walking past them, I found myself ducking behind the corner and eavesdropping on their conversation. So, what else are you still waiting for? Talk to her! I really want to, but I don't know. <sighs> As if the most popular boy in school is dumbstruck by some girl. Who are they talking about? Could it be... me? No way. Lisa, please wake up and stop being so delusional. Fact, boys like Eden would never lay an eye on girls like you. The next morning at school, I walked into class to see the boys, including Eden, chatting about last night's NBA score or something. Only, Eden wouldn't quit staring at me. Um, did I have something on my face? My eyes met his. And then, he immediately turned away and resumed the conversation with his friends like nothing happened. Huh? What did that mean? Then, during chemistry class, I kept sensing this strange feeling coming from behind. So by instinct, I turned around to check. And surprise, surprise, I saw Eden looking at me. But just like earlier, as soon as our gazes met, he stared down at his book. Okay, so that was weird. While I was thinking about his strange behavior, 
Emily suddenly nudged my arm. See, I told you he likes you. You should tell him you like him, too, before it's too late. <laughs> um, no thanks. But what do you mean by too late? I heard that Sarah, you know, his ex, is coming back. Her parents divorced or something. So what? Come on, Lisa. He likes you. But I don't like him. As soon as I finished talking, I saw the teacher glancing straight at me. Oh no, busted. He made me stand up in front of everyone and answer a question. But of course, I hadn't been listening. So I just stood there doing this open-mouthed goldfish look. Then frantically looked around to find some help with the answer. And when I peered over at Eden, oh great, he was grinning at me. This was so embarrassing. That night, I lay in bed and got lost in thoughts about Eden. Okay, so I know I told Emily I didn't like him. It's just that I still didn't believe that someone like him could have a crush on someone like me. Curious, I spent the whole evening stalking Eden's social media account. Not gonna lie, he was indeed really cute. There were loads of pics of him watching basketball matches with his little bro, pulling goofy faces with his friends, and spending time with his family at the beach. Um, so there were also a few pics of him with his ex, and I noticed that she'd commented on some of his recent stuff. I really wished I was brave enough to start a conversation with him, or to even ask him if he still kept in touch with his ex-girlfriend. But that would be weird, wouldn't it? But then, guess what? To my utter disbelief, the next morning, my homeroom teacher walked in, and following her was... S Sarah? Oh no, I should have listened to Emily on this one. Um, so did this mean Eden would get back with her? All day long, Sarah clung onto Eden. So it wasn't long before the rumors started buzzing around school that the dream couple was back together. Not only was this bad enough to deal with, but I also had to put up with Emily's I told you so looks. Whatever, the two of them dating had nothing to do with me, right? They could do what they wanted, and I was just going to carry on with my life. But, geez, this Sarah girl needed to stop spamming everyone's timeline with all these old photos when she and Eden were still in love. Not to mention the cheesy, cringy captions. Okay, I guess my heart ached a little. <sighs> but anyway, I knew I shouldn't care about them. Only, it soon became pretty obvious that Sarah was bothered by me. Every time she passed me in the corridor, she glanced at me and sneered. Huh? Why the attitude? I barely knew the girl. Then one time, I was heading over to the cafeteria when someone shoved me from behind, causing me to fall face first on the ground. Confused, I quickly fumbled for my glasses. Huh? What was that sound? Then suddenly, I heard Emily scream out. Lisa, you just stepped on your glasses! Oh no, now how was I supposed to live without my glasses? Emily had to guide me back to class, and that day, I could only listen to the lectures, because I couldn't see well enough to take notes. By the end of the day, I was fed up and just wanted to go home. I was about to ask Emily to help me walk home, so I didn't end up getting flattened by a bus or something, but before I could ask her... She packed up at lightning speed, said bye, then hurried out of there. Hayes, how thoughtful was my dear bestie? Great. Guess I would just have to navigate my way home alone somehow. It took me ages just to get from the classroom to the school gate. Then I almost bumped into someone. But fortunately, there was a hand that pulled me back. You okay? Came a familiar voice. Eden? I is that you? I asked. Yeah, I'm here, and I'm not having your death on my conscience, <laughs> so I'm walking you home. He took my hand. Eek! My heart somersaulted. Then he led me to the nearby glasses store so I could buy a new pair. After that, he still insisted on walking me home, though, and on the way, we talked loads, mainly about our families and our love of indie movies. Still, I couldn't help but have Sarah at the back of my mind. I just wanted to ask him about their relationship. But now wasn't the right time. Right? A few days later, during a math test, 
I felt something hit my back, then fall to the ground. So I picked it up, but before I could see what it was, the teacher quickly walked over, grabbed it, and opened it. Turns out, it was some of the answers to the test. Oh no! I tried explaining myself, but he told me I would get detention and was not allowed to take the test anymore. What? I couldn't get an F on my math test. It would ruin both my transcript and my college application record. I cried out to him that this wasn't fair, when suddenly, Eden stood up and said, Sir, it was my sheet, not Lisa's. So both of us ended up being banned from taking the test, and the teacher believed that because I picked the note up, I was still just as guilty. I didn't think this day could get any worse. Oh, how wrong I was. During recess, I was rearranging my books in my locker when Sarah approached me. Hey, how dare you let Eden take the blame for your actions? As class president, you should be totally ashamed of yourself. What are you talking about? Your innocent routine may fool Eden, but you aren't fooling me. You wait and see, as I still have bigger plans coming for you. Bigger? What other plans did you have? Huh? Am I missing something? Um, I mean, stop ruining things between Eden and me, else I won't let it slide next time. Um, what was that about? Why was Sarah blaming me? Jeez, this whole situation was crazy. After school, Eden and I had to stay behind for an extra hour for detention. Luckily, our homeroom teacher knew that neither of us would cheat, as we were both exemplary students. So that punishment was just a warning. Then, on our way out of the classroom, I asked him, I know that paper wasn't yours, so why did you help me? Well, um, I knew it wasn't yours either. I saw Sarah throw it at you. Sarah? Yeah, she was behind breaking your glasses too. She pushed me? But why? It, it was me. I'm sorry. She did that because she knows I like you. What? Did I mishear him? Eden just said that he likes... Me? Lisa, I like you. I have for a long time. Um, do you want to go out with me sometime? There was an awkward pause as I soaked up his words. He really likes... Me? Oh, wow. This was bonkers. I gave this huge smile. Then I nodded at him and spluttered out, Yeah, I'd like that. So, after that, we started dating. But this didn't go too well with Sarah. One afternoon, I was walking across the schoolyard when Sarah appeared and shot me this dirty look, which I ignored. Suddenly, she pushed my shoulder, sneered, and then left. I quickly straightened myself up, then shouted after her, Hey, Sarah! I never got a chance to thank you. Sarah immediately turned around and gave me a puzzled look. You know, for getting Eden and me together. Sincerely, thank you, our matchmaker. Then I smiled and left. I'm pretty sure that she was still standing there at me with fiery eyes. But hey, she pranked me first, right? Oh well, karma. Anyway, I just want to let you all know that if you like someone, then don't put yourself down. Instead, be confident and brave enough to tell them how you feel. Because not everyone is lucky enough to have an expert matchmaker like Sarah around to help. <laughs>
a whirlwind of hospital appointments and treatments. I had chemo, and my lovely long hair fell out. I just felt tired and hopeless all of the time. Enough had I had this. I stopped the chemotherapy, quit my job, and decided to enjoy the little time I had left. The Hawaiian beach is so beautiful. Then suddenly, someone walked straight into me. Ugh, their drink soaked me. I heard them say, Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Oh, hey, you're the girl who sat alone at the bar earlier. I looked up, and wow, he was handsome. I shook my head and insisted it was my fault for not paying attention. After that, he joined me for a walk, and we started chatting. Oh, his name is Blake, by the way. So, the next day, I asked him out for lunch. I don't have much of an appetite these days, and the most I could do was staring down at my barely-touched plate. Then, I knew I needed to be honest with him. Hey, Blake, I really like you, and want to get to know you more, but I have cancer and don't have long left. At first, there was a sickening silence, but then he took my hand, and can you believe it? He said he wanted to get to know me, too. The next few weeks with him were magical. Then we came back to the city and continued dating. Blake was so amazing and constantly showered me with love. One night after dinner, Blake drove us up to this hill. He said he wanted to show me Orion's belt, and it was so romantic. I didn't want to ruin the moment, but there was something I needed to tell him. Blake, I saw the doctor today. He said that nothing has changed. Although he didn't mention it, I guess I don't really have much time left. My tears streamed down my face. I've had the best time with you. I really do think I love you. Suddenly, Blake got down on one knee and asked me, My darling Lucy, will you marry me? This is the least I can do for you. I was speechless, so I nodded and then held him tightly in my arms. I was too happy. I couldn't help sharing our love story on social media. Soon, thousands of people were liking and sharing it, saying what an inspirational couple we were. This was crazy, but amazing. Their support made me feel like I could take on my cancer, the world, everything. I started noticing that Blake was getting a lot of attention from other girls. They knew he was the guy who proposed to the dying girl, so they seemed to flock around him and admire him. Then one day, when we were at the wedding dress store together, I stepped out of the fitting room in this beautiful gown, feeling like a princess. But then I spotted Blake talking to some other girl. She touched his shoulder, and I overheard her say, Your fiancé is very lucky to have you. Then she leaned in closer to him. Blake? I hissed at him. Baby, how do I look? He turned away from the girl and stared at me. Yeah, gorgeous. He awkwardly smiled. I couldn't help but feel terrible. I know he's an attractive man, but he was about to marry me. It was not nice at all having him flirt with someone else at my dress fitting. Still, I tried to put it all aside, as I wanted to enjoy what little time I had left. The wedding was a dream come true. It was such a magical day. Then right before our honeymoon, I went to see my doctor. To my complete and utter shock, he told me, I'm pleased to inform you that you're in recovery. Oh my god. I couldn't believe my ears. I was getting better? I rushed home and told Blake the good news. Only his reaction wasn't what I expected. His face dropped, and at first he was speechless. Then he stuttered, c c Congrats, honey. Hmm, what did that even mean? Regardless of this, our honeymoon was marvelous. My appetite was back, and I was making the most of it. Yum! Food tastes so good. This didn't go unnoticed by Blake, and he tutted, Can you try chewing more gently? Whatever. I was intent on enjoying my food. When we arrived back home, I moved into his apartment. For God's sake, there were dirty plates and smelly socks everywhere. 
How could someone so meticulous about their looks live in such a state? I told myself that it was fine. I loved him, so I could learn to love his mess. Ugh. Being alive felt so good. So admittedly, I may have overdone it on the snacks. Cake, meals out, and yeah. I'd gained some extra pounds, so household chores were a bit too much for me. Besides, why should I have to do them? It was his mess. But one time, when I was sick of his stinky underpants everywhere, I asked him, How can a guy who looks like you live in this rat hole? Go clean up. But he ignored me and went straight to bed. And it took no time for his loud thunder snores to follow. What the hell? Where was the kind, charming man I married? Fed up, I tried my best to clean up the place a little bit. I was out of breath and sweating a lot. My head was super itchy, so I took off my wig and scratched my scalp. At that moment, I heard Blake screaming, and when I turned around, he was clutching his face in fear. Baby, what's wrong? I rushed to him. Oh, I got it. I laughed out. It was just too uncomfortable to wear this wig, so I took it off. That's all? But look, my hair is growing back again. Shaking, he stuttered. Y you were wearing a wig this whole time? You look terrifying. Well, yeah, I suppose jagged growing hair made me look quite creepy. <laughs> Shouldn't you be happy for me? I mumbled and forced a smile while trying to put the wig back on. Knowing that I was able to live life again was incredible. But living Blake with my moody, uncaring husband now, that wasn't so great. One evening, he came home from work in a foul mood and started shouting at me for not tidying up. I told him I shouldn't have to as it wasn't my mess. He scowled at me. I single-handedly provide for the both of us. Come home to see you chilling on your huge backside and you dare talk to me like that? You're the one who needs to get up and work since you eat double the amount I do. His words hurt. So with teared up eyes, I said to him, How dare you talk to me like that? Blake was about to say something, but he paused, then just sighed. Look, I'm sorry, babe. I know you're recovering. I sharply stared at him and said, I didn't do anything for dinner, so let's eat out. I was enjoying my rotary chicken. It was so good that I might have taken too big of a bite and it lodged in my throat. Soon I was choking, I couldn't breathe, afraid I looked at Blake for help but he was scrolling through his phone and to my disbelief he walked off to the bathroom. I kept thudding the table to call for help. Luckily a waiter rushed over and hit me real hard on the back and I managed to spit the piece of chicken out. When Blake returned I angrily asked, how the hell could you leave me like that? What are you talking about baby? I saw you enjoying your food. Are you done? Let's go home. Ugh! He definitely knew I was choking. What a jerk. Everything I once thought and expected from him shattered. He was willing to let me choke to death over helping me. The problem was our love story was so famous now. And even though I knew Blake and I couldn't bear each other, the thought of us breaking up and being heckled by others made me feel so sick. I guess I was stuck with him forever. So we had to continue tolerating each other. Then one evening, while I was munching on potato chips and watching TV, my phone rang. It was a strange number. Hello? Are you Blake's wife? Blake's been in a car accident, and we really need you to come here. I froze for a few seconds. Sorry, wrong number, and hung up. My phone rang several more times, but I didn't answer. The guilt started to creep up on me, so I grabbed my bag and rushed to the hospital. The nurse told me to sign some papers so Blake could have his surgery. With a pen in hand, I hesitated. Excuse me, where is the organ donating section? I asked. My husband is willing to donate if anything bad happens. This is not the right time to ask me that question, the nurse yelled at me. Right at that moment, Blake's parents rushed in panicking. I gave them the papers and sneaked back to the apartment. After that, I thought long and hard about our relationship. It had been so passionate at first, but I realized I didn't love him at all, and neither did he. All our decisions were made intensely quickly, based on the idea that I might die later. 
We were too stubborn to admit defeat and walk away, and now we were miserable. A few weeks later, Blake came home in a wheelchair, and we both sat in awkward silence. Then I broke the ice. That night, when I choked at the restaurant, Did you ignore me on purpose? Blake answered me with another question. Is it true you wanted to donate my organs instead of helping me get my surgery? I replied, I'm sorry. That was the only way I could briefly think of to get out of this marriage. He sighed. I know. Me too. I think we're just too similar, and that's why we don't work. He paused. I think it's time we put an end to this. So finally, we stopped putting up with each other and filed for a divorce. People on social media were furious and posted a lot of venomous comments, such as, so much for being an inspirational couple, and this screams out scam marriage to me. I decided to close all of my online accounts. Their opinions don't matter anymore. I have my family support. That's more important. Surprisingly, I'm still friends with Blake. Hey, we went through a lot together, and he's not all bad. I just never want to live with him ever again. (laughs) I even met my current boyfriend through Blake, as he introduced me to him. How funny is that? Sometimes things don't work out as planned, but that's okay. Living a lie just to save a bruised ego is much worse. Oh, by the way, this is my real hair. I am now completely healthy. Remember, you only live once, so make sure you don't waste your time trying to please others, and instead, you embrace life and live it at its best. Hey, I'm Ryan. And I'm here to prove why it's impossible for guys and girls to just be friends. Yeah, I know it's the 21st century and all, but I only reached this conclusion through experience. My ex, Carrie, was friends with this super annoying guy called Chris. They'd known each other for years, but it was obvious he liked her. I saw how gooey-eyed he was around her. She was so insistent that there was nothing going on between them, but guess what? After we broke up, it didn't take long for them to go official on social media. After that, I started dating this awesome girl called Lily. I didn't even mind the fact that there were a few guys in her group, as I eventually befriended them all too. They're all nice, and especially this one guy, Todd, seems like a cool dude. We played basketball together and chatted about video games. Lily didn't like me talking to him, though. She said she found it weird that I was so friendly with him. And she'd rather I wasn't. Whatever, I just put this down to the fact that girls could be weird sometimes. Okay, so maybe Lily didn't seem to like Todd all that much. She never sat by him or really spoke to him. It was probably just some ridiculous girl drama thing. So I continued to chat with Todd as normal. He was a genuine guy who did nice things. Such as when Lily got super drunk at some party, he was the one who called me up to come and get her. And then he stayed up with her until I arrived. I actually kind of felt sorry for Todd as the rest of the group all had partners, so he was left being the gooseberry. Once, when me and Lily were feeding each other strawberries and being all lovey-dovey, I noticed how glum he looked. Suddenly, an idea popped into my head. I should help him find a girlfriend. So I have this one friend called Gemma. She's sweet and pretty, but she can be a little on the overbearing side. She's always sneaking candy bars in my backpack with sticky notes on them saying, Enjoy, love, G, X and she likes every single picture I post on social media pages. I've told her I'm not interested in her like that as I'm with Lily, but she always just smiles and says, I know that, silly. Anyway, Todd struck me as the kind of guy who may like a candy-giving, slightly clingy girl. So on a group outing to the cinema, I told him how I felt bad for him being the only single one in the group, and how I had this friend who'd be perfect for him. At first, he shook his head and said, thanks, but no thanks as he wasn't looking for a girlfriend right now. I wasn't taking no for an answer. So the next week I bombarded him with messages all about how amazing Gemma was. In the end, he agreed to go on a date with her. And afterwards, he messaged me, thanking me for setting it up and telling me how he'd had a great time. Result? 
Just call me Dr. Love, please. Oh, you're welcome. My relationship with Lily was going great. So when she said she was going away for the night with her friends, I told her this was cool, as I trusted her and I trusted them. Then at 3 a.m., when I was shooting zombies on my game, my phone buzzed. It was Todd. We've been playing Truth or Dare. Sorry, but I think you need to hear this. This was followed by a voice message. My heart sank, as in a tipsy voice, I heard Lily say, Before loving Ryan, I actually had feelings for another guy, and I kind of still do now be... The recording ended there. Not that it mattered, as I'd heard enough. My girlfriend liked someone else. Then Todd messaged me. Sorry for that, bro. Thought you deserved the heads up. I thanked him for his honesty. I knew it must have been hard for him to call out Lily. As I saw it, he was a really good guy with the right intentions. For obvious reasons that night, I couldn't sleep at all. So the next morning, I got up early and went for a jog to try and clear my mind fog. That's when Gemma rang me up and asked me out on a picnic. I agreed. I figured that it'd be moping around, all miserable. By the time I arrived back from my jog, Gemma was already parked outside of my dorm, a smile on her face and a picnic basket in hand. I commented on how quick she'd packed it, and she blushed and mentioned something about female intuition. I stank, so I went and showered quickly. Then, as I was getting into Gemma's car, Lily messaged me, telling me she'd be back by noon and I should come over for lunch. But I'm not in any mood to deal with her just yet. So I messaged her, saying I was busy with an assignment. The picnic was great. It was such a sunny day, and Gemma filled the basket with all of my favorite treats. I arrived back feeling positive about things. So what if Lily had a crush on another guy? It didn't mean she didn't love me, right? So I went over to Lily's place, but when she opened the door, she just scowled at me and said, Oh, it's you. Of course it was me. Who else would it be? I followed her inside, but her mood only worsened. I tried asking her about her trip, but she answered with shrugs and eye rolls. Feeling annoyed, I asked her what her problem was. Then she just went into full rage mode and shouted at me. What's my problem? Why don't we talk about you? Where have you been today? Don't think you can lie to me. Then she showed me on her phone, and on the screen was one of Gemma's posts about how she'd had a lovely picnic with me. We're just friends, Lily, you know that. You spent all night with your guy friends, and I didn't moan about it. Well, I know she likes you, and now you're just hanging out with her behind my back. Fueled by anger, I yelled at her. So what? You're not really innocent either. I know you prefer some other guy over me. Well, then I suggest you go and date him instead. What? Whatever. You know what? Fine. Maybe I will. Yeah, well, I think you should. I stormed out of there and charged up the street. By the time I arrived back at my dorm, the reality dawned on me that I'd just broken up with the love of my life. Jeez, this sucked. From then on, whenever I saw Lily around campus, she totally ignored me. It was the worst feeling ever. Todd messaged me a lot to check if I was okay. I kind of hoped he could help me get back with Lily, but I was getting some seriously weird vibes from him. Once, he even sent a message saying, You're an amazing guy, and you're way too good for Lily anyway. Okay, weird. Did he have a crush on me? That would explain why Lily was wary of me making friends with him. Worse still, I had Gemma hanging around me like some sort of limpet. Because I was lonely, I agreed to go for a coffee with her. She left her phone on the table when she went to the toilet. It beeped, so I looked at it. And that's when I saw that Todd had a picture of her, of him holding Lily in her arms, with the caption, Hey, look, I've succeeded. You two quickly finish your quest, although maybe we should pass on the double date. As Gemma walked back over, I waved the picture in front of her and said, I think you have some explaining to do. The color drained from her face, but she gave me a feeble nod. It turns out that on her date with Todd, they discuss how she was crazy about me and how he was into Lily. Then Todd had shown Gemma the messages I'd sent him, telling him how great she was and why I thought he should date her. So he made out I must secretly like her and suggested they come up with a plan to split us up. There I was, thinking Todd was my friend, but turns out the whole time he was an evil genius. Crying, Gemma played me the full voice message that Todd had sent her from that night. Before loving Ryan, I actually had feelings for another guy. And I still kind of do now, but it doesn't matter, as I've decided that Ryan's the guy for me. Besides, some of you have probably noticed that the other guy, well, it's Todd. We're just friends, though, so let's leave it be. I told Gemma to stay away from me. Then I stormed out of there. She shouted after me, but I ignored her, and I've been ignoring her ever since. So, there we go. In the end, opposite-sex friendships never bring any good. 
I wanted to believe that guys and girls could just be friends, but clearly they can't. I've given this a lot of thought and decided to tell Lily everything, as she deserves to know what a cruel and conniving guy Todd is. I don't know how she'll react, but I know I have to let her know, right? I hope she gives me another chance, but it might be too late. Todd tore us apart with his mind games, and I stood by and let him. Jeez, I miss her. Wish me luck. Job hunting is so not fun. But my current job as a waitress isn't working out. There's too much standing around. I now have a blister on my foot. Totally disgusting. Ooh, hang on. This one sounded interesting. Retired couple seeks a well-mannered female housekeeper to attend to their country estate. Board and meals included. This job sounded like such an easy ride, so I called them immediately. And yep, they invited me over. So, this is their country estate. Jeez, it's basically a castle. The owner, Mrs. Harris, answered the door. She seemed friendly enough, and she gave me a tour of the place. I expected her to interview me or something, but in the end, she just showed me a bedroom, then said, I hope this room is adequate enough for you. You'll start tomorrow. My husband and I are away from home quite often. All you have to do is keep an eye on the place and play with our son, as he does get lonely. Huh? I didn't see anything about babysitting in the job description. But I mean, come on, how bad could playing with some little kid be? And who cares? This was the perfect job. They were paying me a high salary to do practically nothing. Not even cleaning or cooking, as they had many maids for that. This was over the top. Some people had way more money than cents. I needed to hurry up and move in. For the first few days, the Harrises weren't around, and I didn't see any signs of a kid. I mooched around the mansion and explored the grounds. Then one day, I was on the third floor inspecting a funny-looking portrait when I heard footsteps behind me. Startled, I turned around and saw a guy holding a teddy bear and licking a lollipop. He was looking straight at me. Okay, weird. Hello? And you are? I asked. Fred, he said, with a very childish tone. Huh? He was like almost 30 already. How come he spoke like that? Fred wants to play. He raised the teddy bear up to my face, like an invitation. All right, I shrugged, then followed him into his room. Whoa, it was like a toy store in there. He wheeled a toy truck over to me, so I took it and made car sounds as I moved it around. He clapped his hands and cheered excitedly. I ended up spending the rest of the day there playing these childish games with him. Then when I looked up, I saw Mr. and Mrs. Harris standing in the doorway. And beside them was a cameraman who was filming Fred and me. They asked to talk privately, so I followed them out to the garden. Mr. Harris started. Fred is our only son. Past traumas affected him. So now, although he appears to be an adult man, he still acts like a kid. Now that made sense. And too bad for him, though. The story continued that Mr. and Mrs. Harris used to work in the media. A few years ago, they decided to record Fred's daily activities, then edited them into videos to make a weekly series on social media. Wow, a show about a man acting like a child? How strange. The audience loves watching Freddy. Mrs. Harris giggled but then she immediately changed her tone. But I do worry they'll soon get tired of watching just him. I think he should have a friend. It will help the show, and it'll be good for Freddy as he'll feel less lonely. I wonder. She looked at me all wide-eyed. Noticing my skeptical look, Mr. Harris jumped in before I even opened my mouth. We'll pay you double. Whoa, what a deal! I mean... It's not like I needed to be an award-winning actress or anything to be in this type of videos. Most importantly, that amount of money was insane. Only an idiot would have turned down an offer like this, right? So I started being friends with Fred. We shared toys, played in the garden, and did all those childlike things together. To be honest, I found him really sweet, and I felt sorry for him. Whenever he saw me, 
He beamed at me and usually handed me his favorite toy, and that made me feel good. So, okay, the cameraman followed us around all day, but I soon forgot he was there. And I also never check out the final videos, as I found it cringy to watch myself. Then one day, the Harris's sat me down to talk to me again. Mrs. Harris looked at me as she said, You may consider Freddy as a child, but he is now a 27-year-old man, handsome and physically healthy. He likes you, and he has every right to date. Then after showing me several comments on the internet, they told me frankly that the views would be higher if I became Fred's girlfriend. So, is it some kind of real-life fairy tale? A kind-hearted girl falls in love with a mentally disadvantaged man? Jeez. But I'm not into him that way. I groaned, pulling a wry face. Darling. She touched my arm. It would only be for the camera, and it would make Freddy so happy. And of course, you'll be generously compensated, Mr. Harris added. Oof, that much money? Who could say no? And it was only acting. Besides, Fred enjoyed making the videos, right? They must have had millions of views for the Harrises to throw money around like this. So I quit hesitating and agreed. They handed me an improv script and told me to do exactly whatever was written in it. The more convincing my performance, the higher my salary. Oh man, not long ago, I didn't have a cent to my name, and now I had thousands of dollars in my bank account. I could go to college, get myself an apartment, etc. A bright future was ahead for me. In the first video, I sat down next to Fred, took his hand, but he immediately started a thumb war. So I gave up on the hand-holding and softly said, Fred, I love spending time with you. You're so sweet and kind, and I have feelings for you. He let out an excitable shout. Then he pretended to be an airplane and did loops around the room. The next few videos didn't get any easier. When I tried to snuggle up to him, he'd whack me with his giant teddy bear. And when I went in for a kiss on his cheek, he pressed a toy car into my face. That was why when I read the next script, in which we were going to have a romantic dinner together, I couldn't help sighing and rolling my eyes. But it was work, so I put on a pretty dress and walked into the dining room. It was decorated with flower petals on the table, and there was mood lighting. Delicious? I asked while he was stuffing his face. He nodded, threw down the silverware, and clapped his hands. Fred cooks for Lynn Eats! Fred chewed as he spoke, spitting food all over. Man, this was so hilarious, I couldn't help laughing. Then he walked over to me and hugged me tightly. Oh my god, he got food stains all over my dress. (laughs) I looked straight into his eyes and thought, yeah, I did like him as a cute little brother. Poor guy. If only he wasn't so unfortunate. Suddenly... I felt his hands tightening around my waist. Stunned, I pushed him back and feigned interest in my food. A huge amount of money was transferred into my account that month, but I didn't feel so youthful anymore. So I started going off script and doing things that I thought were good for Fred. I used his toys to teach him math skills. I read him good books, and I showed him how to make cupcakes. One evening, when I was walking back to my room, Mr. Harris blocked my path and scowling at me said, What the hell are you playing at? Did you even read this week's script? I tried pushing past him, but he grabbed my arm. You're causing our viewers to leave. I'm paying you less this month. I shook myself free of his grip and replied, Money? Is that all that matters to you? Then I rolled my eyes and returned to my room. That night, I ended up looking up the videos. In one of the older ones, Fred was in a suit and looked super uncomfortable. Every time he tried to loosen the tie or unbutton the shirt, a stick went in the frame and hit him in the butt. After a few tries, Fred threw himself on the floor and started having a tantrum. There were so many comments like, OMG, this is way too hilarious, and grow up, man, or don't, for our entertainment. Oh no, people were so mean. Fred didn't choose to be like that. The Harrises were using their own son to get rich by making fun of him. 
Poor Fred. I had to stop this. I packed my bag, stormed into the room where the Harrises were watching TV, and said, I like Fred and still want to be his friend, but I'm not going to be part of this freak show anymore. I quit. And if you care about Fred at all, I suggest you do the same. I expected them to beg me to stay or something, but Mrs. Harris just snarked. All right then, if you want to quit, just leave. Why bother making a fuss about all this? Girls like you won't be hard to replace anyway. How ruthless were they? I was fueled with anger. So I left their dumb mansion immediately and didn't look back. And guess who is cooking in my kitchen while I'm telling you this crazy story? Yep, it's Fred. A few weeks after I left, I answered the doorbell to find Fred standing there. Crazier still, he was acting completely normal. Turns out the Harrises were neglectful of Fred, so he was raised by an old butler, like Bruce and Alfred. When Fred was 15, his parents ended up jobless and in debt. Fred told me, I wanted their attention so badly, so I started acting like I was still a little kid. But then his cute, silly actions meant his parents came up with their crazy video idea. They lied about Fred's age since he does look a bit older, then made him solo act dumb and dumber on camera for years. At first, I thought this would be a good way to help my parents overcome their financial difficulties, but I soon grew tired of pretending and they had more than enough money. So I told them to stop, but they refused. Then he told me that the night I left, he got into a heated argument with his parents and told them he wasn't doing the show ever again. I don't know anyone else and have feelings for no one else, but you, he confessed. And whoa, turns out he's only 19. So I let him stay with me and well, we started dating, like real romantic dates and a real romantic grown-up relationship. I still have a lot of money in my account, and Fred took all the money he deserved from his parents, then moved in with me. I'm starting college next month, and I can't wait. Meanwhile, Fred has found an online course and is waiting for the results from the new part-time job. Also online, well, he's gotta hide for quite a while, since his face is all over the internet but our future together is really wide open this time. Now, excuse me, we have a dinner date to enjoy. This is a real life fairy tale, baby. Holy baloney, who is that? This guy was next level hot, and there's more. As I neared him, he didn't run off looking afraid. Seeing me dumbfoundedly gasping, Scarlet elbowed me. Wake up, chicka, we're late. She giggled as she dragged me to class. I saw it. Never thought I'd see the day that Margot the Troublemaker would go all gooey-eyed over some boy. <laughs> Scarlet teased me. I blushed and was completely tongue-tied, eyes looking around awkwardly. It's a shame you're basically a walking, talking boy repellent. Yeah, right. I lowered my head to think, and when I looked up, Scarlet was texting, probably some cringe overload message to her boyfriend, Keith. I rested my chin on my hands and stared out of the window as I found myself daydreaming about that cute mystery guy. What time do you call this? Are you trying to get me kicked out of this place for covering for you again? Um, so's. I had something super important to do with Alfie. Important, huh? So I could end up in trouble for covering your butt? Because you want to pull some lame prank with that loser? Uh-uh. How many times do I have to tell you? We only pranked him once, and that jerk totally deserved it. About that jerk? He's the captain of the basketball team, and Alfie's my friend. Okay, he might look a bit intimidating, but he's a nice guy. But that jock not only knocked Alfie out with his basketball, he also took his money out of his pocket when he was down. We weren't going to let him get away with this. So that night, we snuck out and poured greasy cooking oil all over the field, which made the whole team slip and fall again and again. It was hilarious. 
Unfortunately, word of our involvement reached the principal, so Scarlet had to call her dad to help me. Okay, so this wasn't exactly the first time Scarlet had saved me. She only got mad as she had to save Alfie's butt too, even though she hates him. <laughs> Come on, I'm sorry. Would you mind? It's midnight and we need to sleep. Shut up, Miley. No one asked you. Fine. Go to bed and shut up so we can actually get some sleep. Oof, those girly girls. Wake up, princess. The class is over. I groggily got up and followed Scarlet like a zombie to the cafeteria. But then I came to an abrupt halt. There, standing on the corner of the hallway, was that handsome guy. What on earth is going on? I've asked Keith to do some research. Now, do you want my help or not? I still froze and couldn't say anything. OMG, I'd never felt so nervous like this before. I nodded while holding her arm. <laughs> wow, so all it took for the mighty Margot to turn into a timid wreck was some dude? Oh, and by the way, he's called Jared, and he's studying classical music. Very elegant. Huh? I blurted out. Classical music? This sucks! I mean, how's a girl like me ever gonna reach his level? Don't worry, I'll help you. Then she changed her attitude. On one condition. Hmm, <laughs> you know what? Scarlet demanded me to stop hanging out with Elfie, because it was not good for the girly image I needed to get Jared's attention. Plus, I wouldn't be allowed to pass the dorm's curfew. If I broke these conditions, then she wouldn't help me anymore. Fine, I agree. Sorry, Elfie, you'll just have to carry on without me. Keith befriended Jared and asked him to come over to our school again to check on those pianos in the music room. When there's an oops emergency, he will leave Jared with me, who it turns out is struggling with the piano. Genius! As you can see, this plan is going well so far. Just this dress was really suffocating me. Ugh, but being around Jared seemed to suffocate me even more. Luckily, he was quite friendly, so we started talking easily, and now he's playing for me. Do you have any plans after school? No, not yet. I'm about to go to this music cafe in town. Would you like to join me? OMG! Of course I said yes! Does this count as a first date? We actually had a lot of fun. I was in seventh heaven. On our way back, I was startled when I saw Alfie across the street. Noticing me with Jared, Alfie glared at me with this maddened, wide-eyed look. I gave him the shush sign and looked away. No surprises. My phone beeped. You blew me off to hang out with that sissy boy? And what's with your clothes? Jeez, Alfie was angry for sure, but... I couldn't do this right now. I'd promised Scarlet I wouldn't talk to him anymore. So I ignored the message and walked straight past him. As soon as I arrived back at the dorm, the girls cooed around and asked me about the date. They seemed so happy for me. So, when's the next date? He asked me to come over to his school tomorrow, and then we're gonna have dinner. Ah! The girls screamed in unison. Surprising, as I didn't think these grumpy girls cared this much about me. I was so excited about the date, so I arrived early at Jared's school to find him practicing with another girl. I walked into the room with a smile on my face, and Jared introduced me to her, Maeve. Then he told me to wait there and left to go to the bathroom. This Maeve girl sniggered, then looked me up and down and said, Give it up. An unrefined girl like you doesn't deserve him. Huh? What on earth did I ever do to her? Angry, I knocked over her music sheets. She picked it up, then sternly said, Just you wait. I won't let you get away with it. Then she shoved past me and stormed off. Then, at dinner, I couldn't help it. So, that Maeve? Ah, our parents are very close. So we've been friends since we were little. And now we both study music. She seems really into you. I'm not so sure about that. We're just friends. So he doesn't like that Maeve girl? I guess. Just forget about her. I have a very important date with Jared and I need your help. Right at that moment, a call from Alfie arrived. But Scarlet was sitting right next to me, so I couldn't pick up. After a few calls, he texted me. 
You gotta help me this time. I can't do it by myself. Oh, God help me. I didn't have the heart to abandon my friend. So, I decided to sneak out and go see Alfie. Okay, so it's not what you think. Those times I was late weren't because we were up to no good. We've been fixing up this abandoned house for these homeless kids instead. This time, one of those kids, Kevin, had a serious fever. I had to help Alfie borrow some money and take Kevin to the hospital. I tried to be deadly quiet as I crept into the dorm room, but I swear, Scarlet is the lightest sleeper in existence. And sure enough, she was there waiting for me. Oh, hi, Margot. It's nice of you to join us. Yeah, sorry. It was, um, an emergency. You just can't help yourself, can you? You broke our agreement to go hang out with that thug friend of yours. I'm not helping you ever again. <sighs> this sucked. It looked like I was on my own. This is it. My big date with Jared. His dad's the conductor here. And from what I can gather, that's a massive deal. Without Scarlet to help me find the right dress for this event was a nightmare. Oh man, everyone looked so luxurious and classy. I felt like a sore thumb. This obviously wasn't the world I belonged to. But Jared's gentle smile soothed me down a lot. But soon, Maeve was coming towards us. Ugh! Jared, darling, congrats! I think this concert will be amazing! Oh, it's you again. Nice dress. Ugh! She was really pulling on my leg. But stay calm. Now breathe. Breathe. Then they both talked about Mozart, Beethoven. I didn't understand a thing, as well as the whole concert. I didn't understand either. Afterward, Jared led me over to his parents. OMG, this was scary. I gave them the bouquet of flowers I've prepared and congratulated them on the concert. Luckily, they both seemed really friendly and were really content with my gift. But then Maeve appeared and hugged Jared's mom. Jared, it's lovely to be around such polite girls. Smirking, Maeve replied. I wouldn't be so sure about that. Margo here likes hiding her true personality. Okay, so I may have failed to keep my cool and blurted out some bad words. Oops. Jared and his parents looked shocked by this, but before I could try and rectify the situation, Maeve pulled out her phone and waved around a photo of me with Alfie. I wanted to explain, but I just ended up stuttering out a load of nonsense. In the end, Jared pulled me aside and told me, I think it's best if you just leave. I ran out of there close to tears. Worse still, I couldn't run in this dumb dress. I'd lost Jared, and it was past curfew. So if I went back now, Scarlet would get mad at me. So I decided that I wasn't going to go back. Nope. Instead, I was going to run away. I'd been staying here for a couple of days. I feel safe here, and Alfie bought me some clothes and food. Ugh. Why is she here? I wasn't in the mood for a lecture. But to my surprise, she rushed over to me and wrapped her arms around me. How could you just leave me like that? Have you any idea how worried I've been? Anyway, Alfie told me everything. I'm sorry for misjudging you. She pulled away. You do stink, though. <laughs> There's one more person who wants to see you, Margot. I looked at him with confusion. Then at the door, it was Jared. Margot, when I saw that photo, I was shocked. I thought I must be some joke to you, and you were really with Alfie. But then I couldn't stop thinking about you. Now I've spoken to Scarlet and Alfie. I know better. I like you, Margot. The real you. And I don't want you to think you have to change for me. Do you think you can give this idiot another chance? I hesitated, pretending that it was something I had to think about. Then smirking, I shouted out, yes, and rushed into his arms. So, what now? Well, I'm back in the dorm, and, yep, I still sneak out, and, yep, Scarlet still covers for me. <laughs> Jared and I are an official couple, and he's even helping me with a fundraiser concert to help out the homeless kids. So, I guess that this tough girl is actually not so tough after all. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.
I'd just finished my shift and was walking out of the coffee shop to head home when I suddenly heard a voice say, Hi, are you Catherine Mill? Ugh, what else? I'm exhausted already. I reluctantly turned around to a view that almost made me leap out of my skin. Standing in front of me was a girl with a face exactly like mine. Who, who are you? I stammered. I felt like I was seeing things. She smiled at me and said, I'm Tracy. Is this wallet yours? Oh, wow, you found it. I dropped it at the Seattle Mariners baseball game. I never thought I'd see it again. That's right. We met there. Then Tracy took out a cap and put it on. Hang on. That hat seemed so familiar. And so did that smile. Um, are you the one I accidentally bumped into at the stadium? That must have been when I dropped my wallet. I was in such a hurry to get to my seat that I'd gone crashing into Tracy. At the time, she was wearing that cap, so all I saw was her smile. But now seeing her standing here, it was like looking in the mirror. I kept staring at her as she said, Yep, that was me. In fact, I came to find you not just to return your wallet, but because I need a favor. Can we chat for a sec? Um, sure. Let's go back inside the cafe. What favor could she possibly want? Well, I was about to find out. Catherine, I'm just going to say it outright. We have something in common, don't we? I hesitated to speak up, but I knew exactly what she was talking about. She then continued. I mean, look at us. You're basically my doppelganger. Which brings me to this favor to ask for. Kathy, I was hoping you'd impersonate me. I'll pay you, of course. I'll pay you a lot. Before I could even reply, Tracy handed me an envelope and showed me a photo of some very posh-looking people. This is my family, she said. Wait, what? Turns out they were royals, or something close to. Her grandfather had been an earl in the UK, and then they'd moved over here to Washington. They're what you'd call an aristocratic family. So, yep, mega wealthy. Must be nice, I thought. However, it was suffocating Tracy, and that all of the duties that came with being from a family of nobility drove her crazy. Plus, one other little problem. She was in love with a guy that her family definitely wouldn't approve of, because he came from a normal family. Her parents had arranged for her to marry the son of one of the country's richest CEOs. And so that's what led us to now. She wanted to hire me to pretend to be her, so that she could be with her lover boy without troubles. I was stunned. What if someone finds out? I muttered and shoved the envelope back into her hands, saying that it was too much money. But Tracy just laughed. Oh, this is just the initial payment. You'll receive so much more. Please, I'm begging you. Think about it. Then she looked at me with proper sadness in her eyes. I really did feel sorry for her. But I needed some time, and it would be better to get my mom's opinion on this first. Ever since I'd been a little girl, I'd always talked things through with her. She was the only family I had, and the only one I could trust and rely on. Mom would know what to do. When I got home, I found my mom waiting for me at the table. We ate dinner together in silence, as I could barely focus. She knew something was up right away. Honey, what happened at work? I hesitated, then handed her the photo of Tracy's family. My mom, as you can guess, was shocked to see how much Tracy looked like me, and so I told her what had gone down earlier. I explained that she offered me a ton of money to impersonate her, but that it felt risky. I'd assumed my mom would be dead set against it, but what she said surprised me. That poor girl. Indeed, how people always say it's not as fun as it looks being too wealthy. But hey, a bit of extra money in your pocket couldn't hurt. I mean, you could use it to pay for your vocal training. And at the same time, you'd help Tracy, so that she can be with her true love. Yeah, becoming a singer had been a lifelong dream of mine. But because of money struggles, I'd had to put that aside. Mom's right. This was my chance. I had to take it so I called Tracy to seal the deal. She was over the moon about it, and we arranged to meet the next day to start preparing. 
I thought I'd just have to learn all of her favorite things and maybe borrow some of her clothes so that I didn't get caught out. But no, there was a whole lot more to it than that. For starters, I had to take etiquette classes. Can you even believe? That first day, I had lessons on how to walk properly. They legitimately did put books on my head to improve my posture. And then came the elocution lessons to teach me how to speak more clearly. Seriously, was this princess diaries or what? But the best part, though, was her wardrobe. Wow, her outfits were to die for. Now that's what gave me the urge to dive into the royal life now. Everything was going well until we sat down to go through all of her likes and dislikes. Her dislikes were about a mile long. Oh man, Tracy was one fussy girl. I mean, who didn't like pizza? I basically lived off the stuff. Plus, she was vegan, gluten-free, and had a nut allergy. What did she even eat? But despite that, we got through the week. Every morning I had my etiquette classes, which now were easy peasy. I could totally pull it off as a high society girl. And then in the afternoons, I hung with Tracy and learned everything I could about her. By the end of the week, we got all things set and ready for the swap. So Tracy and I went out to celebrate. Catherine, look at our faces, she said while squinting her eyes. I took a closer look at the phone screen and gotta admit, despite being pretty identical, there were still some differences between us. Sure, her cheekbones were more prominent and her nose was slightly upturned, but with a bit of makeup, I could fix that, right? Tracy wasn't convinced though. Listen, I think you're going to need to get plastic surgery. Wait, I wasn't ready for any of that. But on second thought, I guess that would be all right, as it'd only make me prettier, which would totally help with my singing career. So I went under the knife. Not only my nose and cheekbones were fixed, but they also added a birthmark to my shoulder to match the one Tracy had. I looked like an Egyptian mummy with all my bandages on, coming out of the operating room. But when the day came to remove them, I was amazed. Just a little touch-up could make me look this incredible. I twirled around in front of the mirror in one of Tracy's glitzy dresses and just smiled. We were totally going to pull this off. Tracy was even more excited than me. She turned to me and said, Ready for the family party? Oh, wow. So my first mission had arrived already. I nervously looked at Tracy, and she just giggled and said, Oh, don't be nervous. It's just my cousin's baby's first birthday party. No big deal. Although, Thomas's whole family will be there. That's the family I'm meant to marry into. Okay, now I was even more worried. Tracy told me to simply do what I learned in the classes. As for Thomas, she instructed me to just ignore him, as that's what she usually did. He was used to the cold shoulder. <laughs> Well, the moment I arrived at the party, I was already so overwhelmed. I couldn't believe my eyes. Her cousin's house was basically a palace with butlers and a grand staircase as you entered, just like in the movies. I almost had to pinch myself that I was even there. As I walked in, one of the butlers asked me to follow him through to the banquet hall. A banquet hall? How insane! There were crystal chandeliers hanging from every part of the ceiling, and the room looked like it was literally made from gold. I noticed Tracy's dad standing in the middle of the room with a young couple and a baby. That would be Tracy's cousin, and the baby was obviously the reason this insane party had been thrown. I took a deep breath, gathered myself, and walked towards them in the way my etiquette teacher had taught me. I greeted them casually, and it seemed no one sensed anything weird. Not even Tracy's dad. However, I was still afraid someone would realize. So I grabbed a glass of wine and went to stand in the corner just to be safe. While I was fiddling with the glass and trying not to make eye contact with anyone, a guy came up to me and clinked my glass. Oh boy, the coolest, most handsome guy ever was standing there grinning at me. I smiled back at him politely, trying not to blush. And then I realized... Wasn't he Thomas and Tracy, the happy couple? Suddenly, I heard Tracy's dad from a few feet away, speaking towards us. You two look exquisite together. 
Be good to him now, Tracy, won't you? Yep, it's Thomas, the fiancé that Tracy doesn't like at all. Okay, so I need to act cold towards him, otherwise I'll ruin everything for Tracy. But heck, he was just so good-looking. I quickly walked away towards the dessert table and started stuffing my face with some almond cookies, anything to distract myself from Thomas. As I picked up a third one, I heard Thomas scream, and the next moment he was running over to me shouting, Tracy, put it down! There are nuts in those! I dropped the cookie in shock. Right. I was supposed to be allergic to these delicious snacks. Totally forgot that. Gosh, I turned around to see all eyes were on me. This was a disaster. I was like a deer in the headlights. Didn't know what else to do. I pretended to faint. Thomas immediately carried me somewhere while others called the family doctor. I only took a peek when I felt like I was let down on a bed. And wow, even their guest room is gorgeous. Anyway, the doctor did some quick checkup and said I was okay. Well, obviously. Then Thomas rushed over, holding my hand and kept saying, Thank God you're okay, baby. Really? How come Tracy didn't like him? He was so sweet. He was looking at me so lovingly. Wait, at Tracy, actually. Oh boy, this was getting weird. Guess I have started off this mission on the wrong foot. But having that first incident actually helped me become more careful, so I've been getting better and better at playing Tracy. I was like a secret agent that would be summoned by duty at any sec. Sometimes you'd find me as a princess, other times I'd be waiting tables. My life was getting busier, but much more fun in some senses. Then one day, Tracy suddenly appeared at my door, looking all loved up. How strange it was. Usually she only contacted me over the phone. Then she said, Kathy, I have a big mission for you. As she sat down, she put a bulging envelope on the table and said, Kathy, sweetie, I need a big favor this time. So here's the thing. Me and Arnold are going to Asia for a month, and, um, I was wondering if you could maybe move into my house and cover for me? I was shocked. A month? Um, that's quite a long time. I mean, surely I'll get caught. Oh, I'm not sure, Tracy. I tried to avoid her eye contact, but she kept begging and looking like she was about to cry. Oh, God. What should I do? Guys. Please give me some advice. And stay tuned. I'll be back with part two to tell you how things go down. <sighs> Why do I have uneasy feelings about all this? Hey, I've been trying to find you at school today. I have big news, and it's bad. Real bad. Don't leave me hanging. Mom says we're defo moving to California by the end of the month. What? No way! That's a two-day drive from here! Yeah, I know! <sighs> but Mom's marrying David. The same David that's scared of spiders, cockroaches, and everything? Yeah, that guy. He's been trying to get her attention for ages. Sending her flowers, playing the guitar on her porch. Then last week, he even climbed up the oak tree so he could hand her flowers through the bedroom window. Okay, that's kind of creepy. Ew. Tell me about it. But you know, the worst part is, I have to transfer to another school. No, no, no. Lisa couldn't move away. Who would I sit with at lunch? Who would I watch corny movies with? Ugh, we've been besties for years. We couldn't just be separated like this. No one would ever understand me like she did. We were like two halves of a whole. Her dad had passed away, so she only had her mom, while I only had my dad. And yep, that's my amazing dad. It's been just me and him for the past 10 years. I still remember that afternoon when my mom took her suitcase and left with another man. After that, me and dad moved back here, to our hometown, New Hampshire. It's only when I got a little older that I found out mom and her lover scammed dad out of everything. So dad's been working his butt off to open his own repair garage to provide for us both ever since. It isn't fair. My dad's a hero, 
and he deserves to be with a better woman. Hold on. Yes, he deserves a better one. And who wouldn't be better than Lisa's mom? I needed to tell Lisa about my plan right now. So I immediately ran to my room and phoned her. Girl, I have the most genius plan ever to keep you and your mom here with me. Please, I'm all ears. Anything. I really don't want to move to Cali. Okay, listen. Let's set your mom up with my dad. He's a good guy, and that means we'll be sisters. We both squealed excitedly. Lisa always wanted to have a dad. A nice one, not that David creep. Ugh, I could see the envy in her eyes when I spoke about the funny pranks I played on my dad. Well, in contrast, my heart ached whenever she told me about the girly pamper days she had with her mom. <sighs> okay, first, research is important. We spent all night looking up their horoscopes, name astrology calculator, and even physiognomy. Whoa, they're a 98% match! But hey, nothing is perfect, right? Me and Lisa would make up for the missing 2%. The next day, we were both zombies due to the lack of sleep. But at least a proper plan had been set. I told Lisa to tell her mom, Mary, to come around on Saturday for my birthday. Um, yeah, it's not actually my birthday. But she's a presenter for a big news channel, so she's super busy. We needed to make up some special occasion so she couldn't say no. Then I told my dad to prepare his signature dish to welcome my special guests. There's no way Mary could resist. That day, I was helping dad with the ingredients when I heard the doorbell. I opened the door to see Lisa standing there with a pink frosted birthday cake. And by her side was her mom. Happy birthday, sweetie. This one's for you. Oh, something smells good. Hmm, and so familiar. She continued. Hello? Mary? Jack? Why are you here? For Aaron's birthday. And you? I'm her father. And FYI, today isn't her birthday. Yeah, jerk. Mary said under her breath while rolling her eyes. Excuse me? You dumped me for no reason. So what's that attitude? Oh, really? For no reason? My eyes darted from dad to Mary. Huh? Why were they yelling at each other? This was very confusing, but I could guess that they used to date? OMG, what a small world! Okay, whatever, cause it's lunchtime now. And wow, Dad's legendary meatloaf smelled amazeballs. We sat down, and Mary glared at Dad as she took a bite of food. Then she blurted out, Oh wow, I guess some things never change, huh? Your food is still super salty. Oh really? But as I recall, someone still asked for seconds. Unbelievable! Excuse me, but do you know each other? Lisa innocently interrupted. There was an awkward silence, then Dad said, Yeah, we do. But this is the first time I've seen Mary since we broke up, right after I visited her studio for the first time. Mary looked flustered as she replied, Lisa, you shouldn't have tricked me into coming here. Finish your food, then we're leaving. On hearing this, Dad ordered Lisa and me up to my room so he could talk to Mary in private. Only, we hid behind the couch and listened in. Turns out, on that day, Mary took my dad to the studio to watch her first filming as a news presenter. After that, she'd passed by the waiting room and overheard Dad talking to someone. I clearly heard that person ask you how I looked, and you said I was still the same old Mary. Do you have any idea that I spent two hours in makeup and was excited to show you? Dad tried to chime in, but Mary wouldn't give him a sec. Worse still, later you even told them you were over the moon I wouldn't be your girlfriend for much longer. Thus, to intercept that, I had to break up with you first. Oh, my. So my dad was a playboy or something? Lisa and I swapped confused looks, then continued watching the show. My dad was dumbfounded, and then he said in a helpless voice, Oh, Mary, things were not like that. I said that you look the same because you're always as beautiful as the day I met you. And about the other thing... Yeah? Um, I prepared a ring to propose to you. 
so you'd no longer be my girlfriend, but my wife. What? So they broke up because of an absurd misunderstanding and lost contact since then. Jeez, I thought adults were meant to know what they were doing. It sure didn't seem like it at times. Mary gave Dad an awkward smile, and they said that they could be friends. Then she told him about David and how she was marrying him on the 22nd of December. No! We couldn't let this happen. There had to be another way of getting them together. But that road was full of thorns and spikes, especially when Dad dropped a bombshell. His new girlfriend, Lucy! A few days later, when I was working on my art project, Dad walked into the room with her. Excuse me? She was wearing this super tight bodycon dress and had at least seven layers of makeup on. Ugh. Then she even dared to pick up the photo of me with Mom and smirked. Oh, how... nice. I rushed over to her, snatched it out of her hands and shouted, Keep off my things! I don't like you! She immediately glared at me. But then seeing Dad coming down from upstairs, she suddenly smiled and hugged me while whispering in my ear, You don't, but you have to. Jeez, what a poisonous snake! But worse, when she left, Dad had this dumb grin on his face, and then he actually asked if I wanted her to be my new mom! Oh no, she'd hypnotized him for sure! In a rush, I called Lisa to tell her about it. She came up with the idea of asking her mom to join us at the Christmas market this week. Bummer. She refused. Apparently she had too much wedding planning to do. Ugh. And if you're thinking it couldn't get worse, then Dad invited Lucy along. So, Lisa asked her mom to let her stay with me for a few days, so we could teach this Lucy some lessons. May the pranking commence. That morning, Lucy showed up in this fancy light blue dress and ordered Dad to get her a chocolate-covered waffle. What a shame. I accidentally knocked it all over her outfit. Oops! Then a fake fly somehow fell into her hot chocolate. Her eyes almost bulged out of her head when she drank that. <laughs> but she just gave us a cunning smirk, then grabbed Dad's arm and cuddled close to him. Unbelievable! But you know, diamond cuts diamond. When Dad went to the restroom, with sparkling eyes, I said, Lucy, I really admire a nice person like you. My dad's only a mechanic with $1,500 a month, but you still love him. Um, so this isn't true. He ran his own business. But anyway... No way! He looks... rich, though. Oh, he probably was just desperate to catch your attention. He bragged a little bit. And you're proud of that? That's not funny, sweetie. I am out of your dad's league. There's no way I'm putting up with a brat like you for such a poor man. Right at that moment, my dad returned and, no surprises, they broke up. Now she was out of the picture, dad was free to win Mary over, right? We three went home, and I noticed that dad was acting weird. He kept on pacing by the door. Then, when Mary arrived to pick Lisa up, he leapt to open it and blurted out to her, Have you thought any more about... us? She didn't say anything, but I noticed them exchanging these sorry looks. Their love for each other was so obviously real, as they knew each other since they had nothing. <sighs> Yet they weren't doing anything about it. It was already December 20th, meaning there were only two days left till the wedding day. I couldn't let our plan fail like this. I immediately grabbed my phone to call Lisa, but the ringing was next to me. She left her phone at my house. Dang! Then the next morning, I walked by her house to go to school as usual, but no one was home, and she wasn't at school either. Oh my, had they moved to David's already? I told Dad this right away when I got home. He thought for a second and asked me to get in the car ASAP to go to California. So our bumper two-day road trip began. When we reached the wedding venue, it was empty. Oh no, we were too late. Dad looked devastated. So I put my arm around him and started to lead him out of there. But then the receptionist appeared and said, Oh, didn't they let you know either? The wedding's been canceled. 
Dad's face lit up, and we both raced over to the car and started the long drive back. Oh, it felt like ages in the car, and now it was just two hours until Christmas Eve. The roads were full of beautiful Christmas decorations. I looked through the windows and saw people gathering with their families, while Dad and I were driving nonstop. How sad. We drove straight to Lisa and Mary's, but they were out, so we sat in the freezing cold on their doorstep and waited. Dad dozed off, his head resting on my shoulder. Bless. Then I saw them walking towards us. Oh man, you should have seen their shocked faces. <laughs> I shook Dad awake, and he looked over at Mary. She dropped her bags and looked at us astonished. Then Lisa told us the whole story. Turns out, on the way to California, they met two amateur robbers who forced them to get out of the car. Mary immediately pounded them with her handbag, while David ran off and hid behind a tree. With Lisa! When the robbers scampered off, Mary told David everything from the bottom of her heart that although David was wealthy, that was not what she wanted. Instead, she just needed a man who could support and protect her. She'd been flattered by his gestures of love, touched by his persistence, and thought that love could be cultivated. But things weren't as simple as that. So they broke up, and the wedding was cancelled. Dad and I were stunned. Then, with eyes prickled with tears, my dad said, Mary, I'm sorry for letting you go. But it's not too late, is it? Right after, he pulled the old ring from that day out of his pocket and got down on one knee and said, Mary, will you marry me? She cried out, Yes! Both Lisa and I were bursting with happiness. So now we both have a mom and a dad, and we're pretty much sisters. Yay! This is the warmest Christmas ever. Hey, I'm Callie. I'm almost 16, but I could live in peace only in the first two years of my child's life, until my little brother, Ethan, came along and ruined everything. I always hoped that that little brat had never been born. And if you're the oldest sibling like I am, then chances are you'll feel the same way as I do. Firstly, his birth meant that my parents barely noticed me anymore. Yeah, I know I was two back then, so I don't actually remember this, but as the years passed by, I saw how it was. I got into trouble for dumb things because I was the oldest, while Ethan got away with everything because he was too young to understand. Ugh, I really hate my brother. And I could tell tons of reasons for that. We always fought over the last slice of pizza. When he got it, He'd eat it open-mouthed in front of me, and Mom would smile and say, Ah, oh, my growing boy. But when I got it, Mom would frown at me and say, Callie, don't be greedy. Ugh! He'd sneak into my room and took the plushy bunny my bestie gave me and superglued its ears together. So I took his switch and hid it in the basement. It took him an entire week to find it. Ha! <laughs> in revenge, he smeared chocolate over the back of my pants. I only realized what was going on when other kids started laughing and pointing at me. I had to wear my sweater tied around my waist for the rest of the day, even though it was freezing. So, I retaliated by rubbing stinging nettles on his pillow. The next morning, his face was bright red, and he couldn't stop itching. It was so funny. It was also a photo shoot day. So much to his protests, a makeup artist spent ages applying makeup on him to cover up the redness. He looked so ridiculous. <laughs> you see, my dad's a politician, so sometimes we have to appear in photo shoots where we look like a loving, harmonious family. Pfft. As if. I could play pretend for the cameras, but in reality, I really just wanted to kick my brother's butt. We just didn't get on at all. He's such a brat. So I guess pranking each other was our coping strategy. I mean, hey, it isn't easy living with someone you hate. Our pranks happen so often, that our parents just let us get on with it. However, there is one thing Ethan is terrified of. It all started back when he was eight, and Dad was watching The Walking Dead. Me and Ethan walked into the room just as there was a zoom-in scene in which a zombie was having a feeding frenzy. Being the brave girl, I thought it was interesting and sat down and watched it with Dad. But my bro, being the wuss, he screamed, then ran out of the room. 
hid under our parents' bed, burst into tears, and refused to move for two hours because he was convinced that at the sight of that zombie, he knew he must be chosen, and zombies were going out to get him. Got a Achilles heel. So not long after that, when he dropped my brand new headphones down the toilet, which made me have to put my hand in to pick it up, I decided to get revenge on him. And luckily for me, Halloween was just around the corner. Perfect. I binge-watched makeup tutorials on YouTube and practiced on my friends. Then on Halloween, I turned myself into a seriously scary zombie, hid the video camera in his room, got into his closet, and made grumbling and moaning sounds. When he opened the closet door, I jumped out at him and tackled him to the floor. OMG, he screamed so loudly and he actually peed his pants. And now, all these years later, I still have it on video to torment him with. Ha! But don't be fooled, as my brother was not your average kitty. It wasn't that long ago that he played a prank on me, which made me madder than Misty from Pokemon. So, I had a crush on this boy from school. He was just so sweet and dreamy, and from the cute glances he kept on giving me, I was 100% sure he liked me too. Valentine's Day seemed like the perfect day to express my feelings toward him. So I stayed up until midnight the night before, making chocolate for him. I left my chocolates lovingly wrapped and boxed on the side, in the kitchen, and went to bed. The next day, I grabbed the box, and at lunchtime, I handed it to my crush. To my utter dismay when he opened it, instead of the lovely heart-shaped chocolates I'd spent hours making, there were embarrassing childhood pics of me, including a photo from when I was 12 with a bunch of hideous pimples on my face. One of me as a toddler sleeping with my mouth open and saliva drool on my chin. And one of me as a baby with a bowl of food mush on my head. Then my crush lifted up a note saying, Great chocolate, sis. That sneaky brat. Although my crush kept saying that I looked really cute in those photos and he liked them even more than chocolates, I still wanted to give that brat a hard punch right in his annoying face. Oh god, I'm begging you, please take him away from me. I'll be good. I'll do my homework on time, and I'll stop borrowing mom's expensive perfume. Okay, so this may have been my wish, but I never expected that it would come true. It was a normal evening around the dinner table. Ethan was glued to his phone, and mom got really annoyed and made him clear up the table. While he was doing that, I saw a message pop up on his phone from someone called Sophie, saying, Okay, I'll see you in the front of the cinema at 8 p.m. I'm looking forward to it, smiley face. What? Ethan had a date? Oh. My sweet little bro, it was payback time for ruining my crush's chocolates. So I stealthily followed Ethan to the cinema. Because the cinema was pretty close to our home, we both walked. He cut through the park. Jeez, it was creepy at this time. I swear the trees looked like monsters. Anyway, I saw something light up by my feet. I picked it up. It was Ethan's phone. What an idiot. I was so going to make him work hard to get this back. As I walked out of the park, I saw a black van parked nearby. Suddenly I heard a scream and saw two giant men trying to drag Ethan toward the back of the van. Ethan was crying and struggling with fierce resistance, but my weak skinny 14-year-old brother was no rival for those two men. What? How dare they try and kidnap my brother? He might have been the most annoying human on the planet, but he was my annoying little brother. There's no way I was letting this happen. I rushed forward and shouted, Ethan, zombie mode on! My presence startled the two kidnappers, and this made them more intent on dragging him toward the van, when all of a sudden, Ethan bit down hard into the hand of the man who was covering his mouth, just like how zombies always do. Good one, bro. The man wept out and shook his hand. The other man pulled on Ethan's arm, but he managed to scramble to his feet. As the man tried to push him into the van, Ethan sought his opportunity and kicked him right between his legs. Ouch. While this was going on, I called the cops and told them to be quick. Then I saw the jerk with the bitten hand about to grab Ethan again. So I screamed out loud, Ethan, run! He sprinted off into the park and the bitten man followed him. It was exactly a real-life zombie chase. Huh. Suddenly, I felt arms grab me around the waist. Oh no, it was the other guy. He said, I guess you'll have to go too. Before he lifted me up and carried me over to the back of the van. I screamed out and tried hitting and kicking out, but he was too strong. He threw me into the back of the van before he could get in. I smashed the van door and quickly locked the door from the inside to knock him out. 
Lucky for me, not him, but the guy chasing Ethan was the one who was keeping the key. It was so scary when the kidnapper kept shouting at me outside, but I was even more frightened thinking Ethan could get hurt somewhere out there. Then suddenly I heard his voice. Hey, stop. Did he get caught? I looked out to see the contrary. He was running towards me after two police officials. They were holding their guns to control the guy standing by the van. Ethan was safe and came back for me. I opened the door and jumped into his arms. Oh, let's skip this part. I get goosebumps every time I recall this weepy situation. Me and Ethan followed the cops and saw the other kidnapper handcuffed to a tree, fighting with mosquitoes with his one free arm in the dark. The police told me that during the way heading to the van, Ethan kept on complaining about how slow and unprofessional they were, as they should come to save me first instead. My boy still stubbornly said, I could run myself, but this wimp couldn't. The idiot definitely couldn't have imagined that he has a Wonder Woman big sister like me. <laughs> Our parents rushed into the police department to see us. And yep, weepy part again. Turned out my dad's rival had hired the guy to kidnap Ethan so that they could use him to blackmail my dad. I don't clearly understand the whole situation. Maybe after this I'll watch more political movies. But now, thanks God, we're safe. I may have wished my brother would disappear, but when I actually could have lost him forever, well, I have to admit that it really freaked me out. And it turns out, he felt the same way about me too. Crazy, huh? Of course, we still play pranks on each other. We wouldn't be us if we didn't. But I realized something. He might be the most annoying brat ever, but he's still my family. And I love my family so much. However, I'm pretty sure there'll still be times when I hate my annoying little bro. Like right now. While I'm sitting in my room telling you my story, I'm sure I can hear him giggling outside of my door. What's the betting I open it and end up with a bucket of cold water on my head or something? All this may because I have told my mom he has a girlfriend. Tough luck, little bro. There's no way you're getting the better of this pranking queen.